Good evening, everybody. I'm going to call to order this evening the uh, City of American Canyon Planning Commission meeting for June 25th. Thank you all for attending. We're going to start with our Pledge of Allegiance. If you could all kindly place your hand over your heart and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can we do roll call, please? Yes, Commissioner Altman. Un unmute yourself, please. Yeah, present. There we go. Great. Commissioner Malari. Commissioner Wong. Present. And Vice Chairman Navarro. Present. And Chairman Goff. Present. Thank you. At this time, Chairman, I'd like to read a, a quick statement uh, about public comment. Okay, please go ahead. So, consistent with California Governor's Executive Order N2920, promoting social distancing, there will be no physical or in-person meeting location available to the public. Instead, the meeting will be conducted by teleconference. The meeting will be accessible for all members of the public to attend and give public comment via the city's website, YouTube, and cable TV channel 28. Members of the public may submit comments on the agenda item prior to and during the meeting by email to njones at cityofamericancanyon.org. Your email should designate the agenda item number for which the written comment is being submitted. If you wish to make verbal rather than written comments, provide your phone number to the above email and the administrative technician will call you during the public comment for your requested item. All comments received prior to the start of the item and during the meeting will be incorporated into the record by the administrative technician. Comments may also be submitted by phone during the agenda item by calling 707-647-4348. However, it is preferable that you supply your phone number ahead of time to avoid hold time. Time allotted for each public comment is determined by the Planning Commissioner Chair and may be up to a maximum of three minutes. These instructions are also included on the front of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move right into public comment now. Um, public comment section is noted on the agenda. This is the time for members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on tonight's agenda. Under state law, matters presented under this section cannot be discussed or acted upon by the Planning Commission during this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public will be invited to make comments at the appropriate time. Please follow the guidelines just laid out about submitting public comments. It is very important to speak well. I guess you're going to speak in the microphone. Let's skip that part. Um, please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Is there any public comments at this point in time? No, we have none, Chairman. Have not received any? Okay. And anybody on the Zoom call at this point in time? Raise your hand if you wish to just speak public comment at this point. Not seeing anyone, so I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Uh, next item is agenda changes. Are there any agenda changes? I don't see any. I have uh, no, no agenda changes for you tonight. Chair Goff. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to consent, consent calendar. Item 1.1, approval of minutes from February 27th, 2020. A long time ago. <laughs> yes, indeed. I will move that we accept these minutes. I second. Okay, so um, Commissioner Altman? Aye. Commissioner Malari? Aye. Commissioner Wong? Aye. Vice Chairman Navarro? Aye. Chairman Gaw? Aye. All right, thank you. Now we're moving on to public hearing items. Um, item 2.1, consider a resolution to approve a mitigated negative declaration and a conditional use permit for a copart automotive storage facility on two parcels totaling 20 acres. And this is file number PL 18-0019. And we have a report. Yes, good evening, um, members of the commission. Uh, let me share my screen here. Patricia Stevens, our contract planner. 
and with the project from the beginning. Okay. Yes, can everybody see the slides okay? Yes. yes. Okay, my name is Tricia Stevens and I'm a contract planner working for the City of American Canyon and I will pre be presenting this project here tonight. Okay. Uh, the project before you is a conditional use permit for an automotive storage facility on two parcels, totaling 20 acres. Copart is a national company that sells damaged and undamaged vehicles to dealers and others uh, via online auctions. And the vehicles are stored on this site until they are delivered to the end users. You also have before you a mitigation mitigated negative declaration. Uh, the project is located at 1660 and 1578 Green Island Road in the general commercial zone. Uh, this is a aerial and a site plan and I'd like to point out some of the main project features. Um, on the south end of the project is Green Island Road. There's one access point. Can everybody see my uh, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I just wanna make sure. Um, there's one access point coming off Green Island Road. Uh, this blue area is a landscape and bioretention area. Uh, this there is uh, 25 parking spots for employees and this is a loading area. Um, this existing warehouse building uh, will be refurbished. It's uh, 6,000 square feet in size and it will include about 3,700 square feet of administrative offices and the rest would be uh, storage. Um, the gold area is where the vehicles will be stored in rows. Um, at the north end of the property is the bioretention area and there'll be a a solid metal fence around the site and in back of the landscaping here will be a wrought iron fence. Mm. Uh, there are several existing buildings on the site that will be demolished. Um, the gold is the warehouse building to be refurbished and all the purple buildings will be demolished and as well as the eucalyptus trees along the street. Uh, this is uh, the building elevations and I'll be talking a little bit more about design in a subsequent slide, but I just want to point out a couple of things. Most of the building will be a vertical gray metal siding that you see here. Mm. Along the frontage will be horizontal, um, darker gray siding and dark blue horizontal uh, siding. So uh, in the general plan, this area is all planned for industrial. Um, this exhibit here is the zoning for the area. It's in the general industrial zone and to the north is the Napa County Airport Industrial Area Specific Plan. Staff uh, believes that the project can be found consistent with the general plan and zoning. We believe it's a quality project that's compatible with surrounding outdoor oriented industrial uses. Uh, most of the other uh, properties around there are either vacant or have some kind of outdoor storage. Um, the project does not generate unacceptable le levels of hazardous materials, noise or air emissions, and it complies with all the zoning development standards related to parking and setback and height and floor area ratio. Uh, staff believes that the project is consistent with the de design guidelines. As I pointed out earlier, the front facade will use 
Copart industry colors of gray and blue, and it provides articulation and visual interest along the front facade by using varied colors, as I pointed out. I think it's important to emphasize that the frontage will have very robust landscaping, um, 28 to 65 feet in, in width with um, um, trees planted and um, and, and this will help provide um, screening of the vehicles. Um, there's solid metal fencing to screen the auto storage around all sides. Uh, we have received comments about traffic and circulation, so I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about um, the situation here. Um, the project would generate about 303 daily vehicle trips um, including employee vehicles and delivery trucks. That includes 30 a.m. peak trips and 27 p.m. peak trips. Uh, the traffic study conducted for the project concludes that um, this amount of traffic um, does not significantly change the level of service. So capacity is, is not really the issue in this case. Um, Green Island Road is designated as an industrial collector with an ultimate width of 80 feet. Uh, we recognize that the road is 20 feet wide and in poor condition. Um, however, staff has found that there is no nexus to require an upgrade to the road um, in that the cost to reconstruct about 2,000 feet um, of roadway is not proportional to the project impacts. Um, there are several mitigating uh, factors. Uh, there's conditions of, of approval that will require uh, dedication of right of way. Uh, the applicant will be entering into a deferred improvement agreement uh, to uh, build, eventually build curb gutter and sidewalk and widen the street. And uh, they will be paying a traffic mitigation fee. And also um, there's a community facilities district, CFD, um, that has been formed in this area that the applicant uh, will not be objecting to. And uh, the CFD will ultimately provide funds to construct the road as the area builds out. A couple other issues I wanted to bring up. First of all, uh, the site is currently served by a septic system and the sewer uh, would need to be extended about 2,000 feet um, from the east in order to serve the property or the applicant has the option to obtain approval from Napa County for an on-site septic system. Uh, at, at this point, further investigation into soil conditions and percolation rates uh, it's necessary in order to get that uh, approval. There is public water available to the site. Uh, there is a robust stormwater plan with two catchment basement, uh, basins and Public Works has confirmed that it will handle um, stormwater runoff. And um, there will be some limited quantities of fuels and solvents and other hazardous materials that will be stored. And uh, there would be some drippage um, onto the ground uh, from the stored vehicles, um, but the applicant has provided a drip management protocol that consists of catch pans and pads and other means to uh, mitigate any drippage. A mitigated negative declaration has been prepared in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act and no significant effects on the environment have been found. There are mitigation measures that are included in the conditions of approval that address um, a variety of different items that you see here in the slide. So staff is recommending that you adopt resolutions with findings and conditions that would um, approve the mitigated negative declaration and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program known as the MMRP and then approve the conditional use permit for an automotive storage facility. So that concludes my presentation for this evening and I'm here to answer any questions.
from the commissioners. Thank you very much. Commission members, any questions? Um, I, I, had, I had a few questions. Go ahead, Commissioner Wong. Okay. Um, so thank you for the presentation, Trisha. I had some questions about the traffic study or maybe some areas where I would appreciate some clarification. So I went ahead and I looked at the full um, document and in the appendices in item J, there was a traffic study reference. And one of the questions I had was the title of the document said it was a draft version. Is there a later version um, or was that the final? That was, uh, we apologize, that was subsequently changed to be a final version. Um, but I guess the right version, there was no difference between the draft and the final. Okay. Um, one of the points that I noticed in this document on page 17, it referenced what we now know as the West Side Connector, and it talked about Commerce Boulevard extending and connecting south to Eucalyptus Drive and Wetlands Edge Road. <laughs> and from a meeting that the city held earlier, that is no longer the case. It's supposed to commerce, commerce Court and Wetlands Edge Court do not connect and no through traffic is allowed. Um, I am going to defer that question to um, Edison or to Brent, um, who might have a little more knowledge on the traffic conditions in that area. Yeah, but perhaps the applicant might have, I know they have um, technical staff available. Um, Copart um, would take its access off of Green Island Road. There really isn't a need for them to go down Commerce. Um, what they're likely reflecting is the existing general plan that does show that indirect connector to eucalyptus. Um, but I, we could take a look at the uh, traffic study. I, I would gather there is very little, if any, traffic that would be generated from this project that would end up heading down commerce uh, to eucalyptus. So I would think it would take its access off of Highway 29 from Green Island Road. And we do have the applicant uh, on the line, including their engineer and the preparer of the uh, CEQA document. Okay, no, I just wanted to express my concern because I knew that mm -hmm. that is something that actually I believe Brent um, is to be decided by the circulation committee for the general plan, um, the West Side Connector where it comes out. So. So the configuration today is a cul-de-sac. Yeah. And so oftentimes what, what happens in traffic studies is they do a short-term and a long-term analysis. The long-term analysis would reflect the general plan. The short-term analysis would reflect conditions today. So it's likely in a long-term analysis, which would be looking at whether or not there are significant impacts, it would evaluate the general plan as it's written today. And, and the traffic state concluded there are no long-term traffic impacts. So it isn't saying that traffic will go down commerce to eucalyptus. It's showing what might be a, a possible traffic analysis outcome if, if it were to happen and then conclude there isn't significant traffic. So the goal here is to determine if there's significant traffic impacts. If there are, well then it dives deeper into what you might do about it. But, but we know that the road is being configured as a cul-de-sac so we're kind of in this limbo middle, middle point stage at this time where we have a general plan that says one thing and in the short term it says something else. But the goal here is to determine if there are any significant traffic impacts and it shows that there's, the traffic isn't heading that direction generally and there's no significant impacts. Okay. I mean, uh, I, oh, never mind. I'm, I'm applicant ahead. representative. I just would like to say that I concur with uh, Mr. Cooper's analysis. I don't think any of our traffic would be using commerce, um, but uh, I'll just defer to Mr. Cooper. Yeah, the, the, the business is the business is to to move vehicles, most of which are damaged, in and out of a site, um, and there's no need for them to have a, 
traveled on eucalyptus and commerce to get there, they would be coming off of Highway 29 and Green Allen Road is kind of the logical, most direct route they would take. Okay, I just wanted to know about commerce being a port and no through yeah. traffic. It sounds like, I, I understand what you're saying about the mm -hmm. traffic study. Um, I did have a question about the timing of the deferred improvement agreement, Tricia, that you mentioned, because one of the points made in that traffic study was about the, um, the lack of pedestrian facilities along the project frontage, and it said it was a um, potentially significant pedestrian impact. So what would be the timing of the deferred improvement agreement as far as improving that? Well, it would depend on when other properties in the area are developed. Uh, so when there's enough um, build out of the area, then uh, that agreement would be invoked and the improvements put in. Yeah, we do have a representative from Public Works here. Um, he, could, he could talk about um, deferred improvement agreements. We have Edison with us today, very nice. And uh, um, he could describe how this fits into the larger picture with Green Island Road, um, the way it is today. In a very general sense before he, he begins talking, um, that segment of road has very low traffic um, volumes today. And, and so there isn't a tremendous danger of high speed vehicles on the roadway for pedestrians, but, but um, and there are a lot of older properties that are without sidewalks um, in the vicinity. Um, so kind of with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Edison to maybe fill in some of the gaps I've missed. Um, uh, right now, the Green Island Road is uh, scheduled for a uh, widening. Unfortunately, it does not extend all the way to the Copart uh, facility. It's only extending uh, past Commerce. And uh, I'm not sure the timing of when uh, the rest of Green Island Road is going to be uh, improved. But uh, uh, Following on Tricia's uh, explanation earlier, that the, 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 the timing of the deferral will be based on the developments of other parcels. So if other parcels will start developing, and then uh, then it will be you know uh, it will be that deferred uh, improvement will then be uh, uh, reviewed and, uh, and if it is uh, possible to uh, to uh, start that development once uh, the other parcels uh, are developing as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I had another question. I was hoping maybe just someone could speak to this and maybe provide more transparency. There was, it talked about a vehicle LOS no longer being used for land use projects. And it said that the city, our city, we haven't adopted it yet, but that we would be doing it no later than July 1st, 2020. I'll have um, that for the <laughs> Edison. Why don't I take it, take it, take it, answer this one. Um, I think what the, what the traffic study is referring to is a state law um, SB 743. It was adopted several years ago um, and what it says is that uh, traffic congestion is measured by a level of service is no longer an issue under the California Environmental Quality Act. And the reason for that is um, by making roads free flow it just encourages more traffic which then encourages sprawl. So the metric now that is required is encouraging projects that have more carpooling and transit use and maybe bicycle, but non-single occupant automobile. The state law also says that um, this regulation takes effect on July 1st of this year. So cities had the option of adopting it sooner, but no later than new projects come July 1st, 2020 uh, will become applicable. Now, with any state law, it's never simple. There are a variety of exceptions to that start date. Um, first one 
would be if your general plan has a level of service standard, well then it's still in effect because it's in your general plan. You have to have general plan consistency. So that would be one exception. Um, a second one are projects that already have environmental impact reports such as Watson Ranch. Um, so that would be another one where you've already got an adopted environmental impact report. So this requirement doesn't apply. There's a, there's a what they call screening mechanism where smaller projects and exempt projects kind of go through. But for those that don't have any environmental review, it does take effect. But um, I think that's, it's, I think providing some background on, on uh, context under which traffic studies are, are being looked at today. Okay, thank you. I was just, uh, that additional context is helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had, I guess, just one more question about the Copart project. So will there be any electric car, if they um, have electric cars on the property, will they be doing battery removals and storing the batteries on site, or are there batteries from electric cars involved somehow? Um, we are not knowledgeable about um, battery batteries being stored, but I think in the applicant's presentation they can explain that. Okay. Um, Trisha, perhaps I think there's a condition. I know the staff report says there's no uh, vehicle dismantling um, and of the sort. Um, on the site, and I'm, I'm guessing there's a condition of approval that verifies that. Um, uh, yes. That's, you know, if we're looking at issues of, of electric cars and their batteries, um, they would stay, if there's electric car, the batteries, or, or perhaps also um, hybrids, you know, the battery would just stay with the vehicle. Yes. Yeah, no, there would okay. be dismantling. Yes, there is a condition of approval to that effect. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Any other commission members wish for questions? Yes. Mr. Of course. <clears throat> um, I've got two areas of uh, potential concern. One is um, I understand there is a drip mitigation plan, but do we know if there is any underground water source that would be at risk of contamination. Um, so that's the first question. So um, they will be containing any drippage from the vehicle. So um, they will be managing that so that there wouldn't be any hazardous materials that would go into the ground and into the groundwater. And what if there's a defect, mistake, error, or whatever with the, uh, you know, what, what level of assurance does the city have that the mitigation will be effective? That, uh, that condition will be monitored over time. Um, and if there's any indication of um, drippage that isn't being contained, then uh, that will become an enforcement issue. But that's why I'm asking if we are aware of any underground water sources. Because yeah. it, it's one thing if it's just some uh, gas or oil or whatnot dripping into soil. Um, yeah, not the best, we don't like it, but it's cleanable, you can address it. If there's an underground water source and you've got oil dripping into it or gasoline or whatnot, you've got a much different level of uh, issues and concerns. Um, and catching it after the fact could be effectively too late to uh, have avoided a potential problem. That, that's why I'm asking. Okay, well, there is no well on the site. So the, um, there's public water to the site, so there is not a under, you know, there's not a well with the underwater water source. So there's no underground aquifer. There's no underground um, that we're aware of. I 
uh, may in terms of an aquifer underneath um let me do a little bit of checking on that let me see if i can answer that question more precisely or the sequa preparer um, might be able to answer that question but give me a moment to look that up sure okay And, and I know that the applicants um, prepared their consultant prepared the initial study. Um, are they present? Yes. Um, Perhaps I know they did an initial study. This is a typical thing that's been reviewed in initial study. Perhaps if they're available, they could comment on that. Uh, yes, they're um, AES, Katie Alonso. Do you have any information on that, KT? It's important to note that prior to this project, the site was used for automotive dismantling and salvage. So this, the, the, essentially the land use is not changing. It had, um, it had stored automotive salvage cars on the site prior to this project. Um, so if any drippage or, or any spills were occurring then, you know, that, that was an existing issue to, to think about. Um, as of this project, this project does not involve dismantling or storage. Um, I'm sorry, dismantling or salvage. It's storage only. So that's a big safety step right there. Um, we, we have mention of preparing a SWIP a stormwater pollution prevention plan in the CEQA document. We have some basic hazardous materials mitigation measures involved as well. The drip plan incorporates um, catchments and, and drip pans um, and things that would help any potential accidents. Um, but ultimately, I think the most important thing to take away is that the project as it stands is actually lessening the hazards of the previous land use out there. And, and um, Mr. Altman, there is a mitigation measure um, in, called uh, HAZ-1 that is required for accidental hazardous material spills. This is in the MMRP or the... Um, it is. CUP, it's in the MMRP? Okay, it I is. might have missed it. Because I looked through that in the as... I think it's what it came out. Uh, yes, it's um, condition number 77. Yeah, in the MMRP, I, I, I saw that. It, it's not really addressing sort of my concern, which is the unknown, to be honest, in terms of is there water underneath the site um, because, you know, doing what I do professionally, um, I deal with hazardous environmental uh, conditions uh, periodically. And um, once, you know, soil contamination is, is relatively easy to address. Water contamination is a whole nother story. Um, and, and that's why I'm asking because, you know, and, and yes, I understand that the uh, intensity of use uh, by Copart is likely to be less than it was previously. Um, and that's, that's all well and good, but it, it still doesn't tell me whether there is a potential risk for uh, water contamination because water flows. And if there is an underground um, aquifer, spring, river, whatever, um, that gets polluted, it leads elsewhere and leads to potentially much more significant um, problems and issues. I, again, I, I understand the mitigation measures. I appreciate the mitigation measures, the, the drip management and so on. Um, that's all prudent. Uh, my concern is stuff happens. Um, and sometimes the best laid plans go awry and I'm just trying to figure out, is there a potential bigger risk? Again, if it's just, if it's just soil, hey, fine. Uh, you know, it, it, there are lots of ways to deal with soil. Um, if it's water, it's a different 
it's a, it's at a whole different level. So that that's that's why I'm asking. Um, I'm looking at the um, hydrology section of the MND, and I see no mention of any aquifer underneath the no, site. There, there, there are no known aquifers or water sources within the project site bounds or underground. Okay, good. That, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> that, that's, that's my concern. Um, if there's no known water, I'm a heck of a lot more comfortable uh, with, with the mitigation measures. Um, so thank you. <clears throat> the uh, next question I've got, uh, it has to do with um, Green Island Road and uh, reconstruction and how far and when and so on. Um, and thank you, Ed Edison, for advising that um, Green Island Road is scheduled to uh, undergo work and be widened. What I don't have um, off the top of my head and what I haven't seen is a map that shows me sort of where the um, boundaries are in terms of what's going to be uh, widened and what is not. Uh, Edison did mention that this section is not on the current plan and again, I'm raising this because we did get a um, comment um, regarding uh, concern about the uh, potential damage of, of um, vehicles, bringing vehicles to or taking vehicles from this site, further damaging uh, this section of Green Island Road, which we all acknowledge is in poor condition to begin with. So do we have any, any, you know, way to, how can you either talk me through or give me some sort of visual so I understand where commerce is relative to here? Um, and, you know, is there any sort of timeline as to when this section um, would be addressed? Uh, right now, the plan for the Green Island improvement starts from uh, Highway 29. Uh, going straight all the way to commerce only. So the Green Island Road uh, turns at that section and uh, all the way to uh, to the uh, end to the airport area, uh, going to that uh, co park. But unfortunately, the the plan right now does not include that section. Uh, when is that going to be improved? I'm not sure. There is no plan yet. I have not seen a plan, but. In the future, uh, per that condition, uh, that uh, co-part, the developer will uh, will uh, widen that section of uh, Green Island Road, uh, their frontage. Uh, that one right now is uh, deferred. Uh, that Green Island Road uh, will be uh, improved later on once uh, there are some improvements. Uh, you know, parcels will get improved. And then uh, we're gonna evaluate if that's the right time uh, that we can uh, improve uh, Green Island Road. But for now, there's no plan yet. So how, how far is the Copart site from where the widening is going to finish? Is it, are we talking it's a quarter mile away? Is it two and a half miles away? What, what's- Let me distance? open a map and uh, I will share my screen. Great, thank you. I'm sorry, my uh, internet's a little bit slower. <laughs> a lot of people are using this hour at my house doing some gaming. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna share my screen now. Thank you. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, the map of uh, that area. So if you follow my, uh, my cursor, uh, this is Green Island Road. And then it turns to the north and then uh, turns uh, northeast uh, to the Copart side. I believe this is Copart uh, here, Pressure. Can you confirm? And a little bit more to the west. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, here. Um, more to the east. More where to it the says east. Um, uh, scaffold Thank solutions. You. Yeah. Uh, over here. Yeah. No. Um, I got it. No, further down. Further down. down. Right GMM here. sanitary and scaffold solutions. Oh, yeah. It's just to the right of Baker Storage. Uh, it's this one. Yes. No, it's, it's to one. the right of Baker Storage. Yeah, yeah it's this one. Yeah. There it's we go. Clean looking yeah. site. Yeah. Where it says stucco stone. stone. Yeah, that one. So the the plan for the Green Island uh, widening right now starts from uh, Paoli Loop all the way to the end here end of uh, Green Island to the cul-de-sac here. And unfortunately, this portion of uh, Green Island Road, uh, there's no plan of uh, widening it yet. And this widening will happen soon. This one here. It will okay, happen soon. So, yeah. so the, it'll go down to US wine transport. Yeah, it will end right there. Uh, that's, okay. That's Jim Oswalt Way. Mazetta is the is the terminus. Yeah, that's the terminus. Yeah, this portion of Green Island Road, uh, we're not sure yet when it's gonna be improved. But uh, as as parcels here, properties here gets developed, then it's gonna be evaluated when's the right time to uh, continue that improvement. Okay. Looking at this, it's like a, it's like a half a mile. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. That helps. Thank you. And that does it for me for now. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Altman. Uh, Commissioner Navarro, any comments? Um, I, I, I read through it. I'm still absorbing it. I, I don't have any, um, any questions or, uh, comments except that, um, it was, it's been a very thorough presentation, a very thorough, um, uh, analysis that I, I can tell has taken some time. So, um, I'm okay. Thank you. Commissioner Bullard. So just a few questions on the the hours. Um, I know it says that it's um, Monday through Friday. Is there any potential possibility that it would op operate on the, the weekends or is it just solely just Monday through Friday? Possibly. Speaking. It has been indicated to us that it'll be all Monday through Friday, eight to five. Eight to five, okay. And then the, um, the administrative building that's going to get refurbished it says that there's a the the square footage is for um, the remainder of the square footage is for storage and repairs um can you elaborate on what the what the repairs um um will mean i i could speak to that as the applicant representative i think that was a little bit of an error that Cars will not be entering into the facility, that structure. There's a overhang structure that um, the larger equipment front loaders that are used to offload and onload the vehicles with like forklift um, instead of a dump in the front. And mm -hmm. I have a photo of that. Those vehicles will be stored there. And there, those would be, you know, that's what the, the, the minor amount of hazardous materials that would be stored on site would be fuel for those vehicles, grease to maintain them, et cetera. Um, but all the servicing of that would be done by a certified third party um, environmental you know, uh, entity that come on site, conduct the required maintenance and then take any hazardous materials like used oil off site. Okay. Um, and how big are like we talking about as far as the transportation um, of the of the vehicles? This is it like a I don't know a flatbed of like twenty to thirty car capacity, or I, I'm just trying to envision how big these vehicles or the, the trucks would be. We could we could address that during our presentation. Um, 
that would be perfect. Just trying to envision how it would be. Um, and I think, let's see, what else do I have? Um, yep, I, I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just have one question, um, and this has to do with the possible sewer extension or the septic system. If a septic system won't work and the county say it won't work, they're required to do a connection to our sewer system. Would that require the re redoing that portion of Green Island Road delay in that septic connection? Uh, Edison, can you answer that? Uh, that I'm not sure because normally Normally, if you are uh, installing a uh, utility, unless it is conditioned, you're only going to patch back what you have removed. So there'll be a, there'll be a trench excavated for the sewer. For the sewer and line. so that you have a nice smooth stretch of trench where yeah. the new sewer went in. And then they, they will only be required to patch that uh, mm -hmm. trench. <laughs> Thank you, that's what I thought. Thank you very much. Um, is the applicant want to do a presentation? I know it was mentioned. Ever you guys are ready for us. Yeah, we're ready, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna share the screen here real quick. Um, see if I can make this work. Let me see slideshow. Okay, can you guys see that? Not yet. Yeah. How about now? No. Hmm. Let me see. The bottom of your screen, there'll be a green arrow. It's a share screen. Yeah, I clicked on that. This comes up. Okay. Share. There you go. Okay. Go. All right. So here, so from the beginning. There we go. Okay. Well, uh, uh, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Tom Adams. Um, I'm located at 1455 First Street in Napa, California, and I'm representing the applicant. Uh, um, along with me today, we've got the whole project team, or most of us. We've got uh, Jeremy. Metal Barger with Copart you can answer any questions related specifically to their operations that I can't. We have Tony Perfetto, our project engineer. We have Paul Friend, our project architect. And we have, um, as you've already heard from uh, representatives from AES, the consultant that prepared the initial study and mitigated negative declaration for the city. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the, you know, planning director, Brent Cooper and all his staff uh, for putting in all the hard work. This has been a long road. Um, we've worked hard on this project. And uh, Tricia, I think you did a great job in the presentation. So I'm, I'm not gonna be redundant. I'll try to focus on some of the questions that I heard from the commissioners and um, give you a little bit of a taste of what Copart's all about and what our operations will entail. So a little bit about the background of Copart. Um, Copart was founded in 1982 by Willis J. Johnson uh, in Vallejo, California, so not too far from the city of Marin Canyon. Uh, in 1994, um, as the company was, had grown quite a bit, um, they made their initial public offering uh, as a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ. Um, in 2012, Copart relocated its corporate headquarters from Fairfield, California, where it had moved from Vallejo. Uh, to Dallas, Texas, where the headquarters is located today. Uh, currently, Copart has more than 200 locations across the U.S. and internationally, including Canada, the U.K., uh, Brazil, Germany, India, Republic of Ireland, and other countries. Um, as far as operations go, Tom, I mean, is, yes, I just want to. I just want to double check. Are you still on the very first slide? Or are you changing slides? Because I am. I, I don't have my whole PowerPoint on this. Okay. I'm just. I'll get to some. I have a bunch of photos that are kind of, are you know, entail the rest of the presentation. So I apologize. But the uh, American Canyon operations. It's really a short-term vehicle storage facility. So the vehicles will stay on 
site for an average of 60 days. Um, so they'll be received and then they'll be stored until there's a buyer and then they'll be shipped off site via um, a transport vehicle. Um, the office that was shown will um, provide the administrative functions for transferring title for vehicles and assisting with the administrative needs of the online sales um, to process those transactions, which will generate sales revenue for the local um, jurisdiction, which in this case is the city of Marion Canyon. So this activity or business uh, uh, that we're proposing will be generating uh, sales tax, uh, something that not all businesses um, such as car storage um, facilities and some of these salvage yards really have um, in the past. Like we, we're going to have 15 to 25 employees, um, hours of operation, Monday through fri Friday, eight to five, um, no dismantling, fluid drainage or crushing or modification to vehicles. And um, I think that's an important thing to talk a little bit about because th these vehicles will, before they arrive onto this site, will be drained of any fluids that are leaking and be, um, so any known issues related to fluids, et cetera, will be addressed prior to them arriving. And upon arrival, they'll be re-inspected. And if there is an issue, they'll implement their drip management plan, BMPs that are applied company-wide throughout all their locations, um, not only to protect the environment, which is important and a main objective of Copart, but also to protect the company from liability. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, if there is an environmental issue on these properties, Copart as the property owner will be responsible under state and federal law. And that will include any cleanup that's required and they wanna avoid those additional costs. So if that's soil contamination, they would be on the hook to clean that up as well as any water contamination that could occur but is unlikely uh, given the strict kind of environmental policies they put in place to inspect vehicles and make sure that there aren't any known issues before they arrive and then the reinspection when they arrive on site. Um, so here is a view of the properties, an aerial view. Uh, you know, there's 1660 is the larger property that's largely an open field now, but it'll have the office. And then you'll see the, the five acre property, which has been used historically for the salvage operations. Uh, that'll be included within um, the project and just be used for vehicle storage. So these buildings on that, that uh, APN or property will be demolished. Um, uh, of note, the property that's adjacent to Baker property um, that was uh, subject of a fire, I think it was in 2017, shortly after the 2017 fires, um, this was burned over and they underwent a major review of environmental impacts associated with that in response to state um, oversight. And that property was actually, despite the fact that there was all this historic salvage operation going on, it was able to be cleaned and given a clean bill of health. Um, in addition, both these properties that are part of the project uh, underwent um, environmental site assessments prior to Copart acquisition to assure um, what the environmental baseline was related to hazardous materials and any potential contamination. Uh, so, um, We've got a pretty good handle on it and we appreciate your concern over potential environmental issues and um, Copart makes that a priority uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is the liability that could result in it. And so they make that a business objective to limit it because they do this on 200 sites. So if they, if they weren't being good stewards, they could really incur some, some major issues down the road. Uh, here's the existing, some photos of the existing site, kind of dilapidated older buildings, open fields. This is the 1660 parcel. You can see kind of in the background, these photos aren't real clear, but these are the some of the cars that were um, destroyed during the 2017 fire. And uh, the city of Marin Canyon was um, good enough to provide a temporary permit to allow for Copart to bring these fire damage vehicles on site and to get them out of the county and process them to assist in our recovery effort. 
Um, that has all been wrapped up, but uh, we'd like to thank the staff for facilitating that. Uh, made a, a big difference in the ability to get a lot of these cars out of the county because it's not an easy process. You know, tile has to be transferred. Uh, it's quite involved. Uh, here's some additional photos. Uh, this, I, if you can see my cursor right here, this is the five acre parcel after the vehicles uh, had been removed. So the salvage vehicles were all removed. So it looks pretty clean. You can see the older fence, et cetera, some of the burned vehicles that, you know, this, these are older photos but you can get a sense as to what the existing conditions are out there. Um, here's a picture that you've already seen, but uh, I guess we'll just use this slide for me to kind of get into some of the site improvements, right? And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that with remodeling existing structure to current code and standards. Uh, we have water efficient landscaping going in per state and local requirements. We have under, we're gonna underground the utilities, the overhead utilities on the frontage as part of the uh, construction that's not deferred. Um, we do have the deferred sidewalk curb and gutter and road widening uh, agreement as a condition and that's just a kind of a common sense because we don't want to build those new improvements as an island without anything to connect them to, no drainage. So you know we'd have a curb and gutter just leading to a, a roadside ditch. So we were just gonna wait until the time was right when surrounding properties were being improved and the road was being widening, widened and it'd all be done at once. Um, we have improved stormwater controls that address not only stormwater flows on, to, you know, off the property, but also water quality. Uh, they're detained and there's some uh, treatment on site um, through the detention basins. And then we have the new fencing with a, a wrought iron, um, fence at the front behind the landscaping so you have a nice uh, aesthetic from the street. Uh, here's the building elevations, uh, front, rear, right side, left side, and here's the color, color palette, so gray to blue. Um, and here's kind of just a site plan. These, these shapes here, these rectangles with the rounded edges, those are where the cars would be stored. And here's the parking lot and the building. Um, Again, this is to the north where you have the Southern Pacific Railroad and another uh, stormwater detention basin here. So the project, uh, and here's the landscape plan. So the project really meets, as staff's already indicated, all the, the general plans, zoning requirements, meets or exceeds development standards, landscaping standards, industrial performance standards related to hazmat. Again, we have a robust drip management, BMPs that we implement on all the sites. Um, we've complied with the zero water footprint policy of the city. Uh, this is a very low water use project. We have landscaping and we have the commercial use of water for the restrooms and um, drinking water for the um, employees and an occasional uh, customer that may come to inspect a vehicle, which is not going to happen very often. Um, and then we have the stormwater controls and water quality um, improvements that have been vetted by Public Works and we implemented through our stormwater pollution prevention plan. Um, on the CEQA side of things, um, mitigated neg deck, we didn't receive any comments during the 20 day comment period, but we did receive comments uh, before the hearing related to the improvements um, or the condition really of Green Island Road, which we acknowledge is not in great condition. Um, and uh, I wanna say one that comment came from a property owner outside of the city in the county further down um, the road. But I think some of the things that we're doing to address that is we're, we've agreed to participate in the community facilities district, which would allow us to contribute our fair share to any road improvements um, along with other users of the road and property owners. Um, we've agreed, to, we're going to be paying a traffic mitigation fee of uh, 185,000 plus dollars for uh, Trisha's analysis. Um, that'll be paid prior to the issuance of the building permit. Um, and we also have, uh, are generating sales tax, which via measure T, 0.25% uh, of that will go towards road maintenance projects throughout the county and shared with the city, including the city of Marin Canyon. So that'll also contribute funding to the ability 
to do some maintenance to Green Island Road. Um, those are the main issues. And again, we dedicated the right of way. Um, I wanted to get to some of the questions that the commissioners had. Um, again, I looked at the traffic analysis and I don't, I couldn't see any project trips being contributed to commerce, going down commerce. Uh, you know, they were all out trips um, from Green Island Road to 29. So I think that should address that question you had consistent with Mr. Cooper's comments. Um, groundwater contamination, as I said, I think my uh, discussion of how Copart deals with that potential up front before cars come onto, site, onto the site uh, should be responsive to that um, along with the drip management protocols. Um, now vehicle use, uh, as far as hauling vehicles, I think Jeremy, who's here as a representative of Copart and has been involved in this project since the beginning, he might be able to speak more intelligently about that than myself, because I'm not sure exactly whether they use various size vehicles depending on the, the number of vehicles they're hauling or, or not. So Jeremy, um, are, are, can you answer that question? Uh, Thomas, can you uh, stop sharing your screen if you're done yeah. with the slides? Okay, great. Stop share. Uh, yeah. Jeremy, are you there? Yes, Tom, thank you. Can you hear me, everyone hear me okay? I think so, yeah. Okay. So yeah, the, to elaborate on that, the cars are taken a uh, majority of the time. It, it ranges from either a single uh, flatbed uh, carrier all the way up to the largest being a 10 car carrier. So. 10 would be the maximum amount of vehicles that would go out of the site uh, at one time. Um, and I can elaborate on, there was a question earlier regarding um, electric cars and batteries. Um, all of the units that come into each one of our facilities around the world, they come in whole and they leave whole. We are not allowed to or don't handle um, any dismantling, uh, draining of fluids, et cetera. So, um, and to elaborate on that, and the reason for that is the insurance companies are the ones that actually own our vehicles. We don't own any of the vehicles. We're more of a storage facility. Um, and in that duration that we're storing it is when they're being marketed um, and the title is being transferred into our name so that when the end user comes to uh, pay and pick up their vehicle, everything is uh, taken care of and then they can be hauled away on, like I said, uh, either a one to 10 car carrier. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, if you have any other questions specifically for Jeremy, this would be a good time. If, if not, I was planning on showing you some aerial photographs of other Copart facilities in California that might provide a better picture of what the ultimate project might look like. I had a question and I'm not sure if Jeremy is the right person to answer or not. Go ahead. I, would, I was wondering, do you have sort of like an average time that a car remains on site with you as part of your inventory before it's sold? 60 days is what the average um, length of time is. That is correct. Right now, that, that's just a company metric that we measure. And right now, it's running uh, 40 to 60 cars or excuse me, 40 to 60 days uh, per unit. Thank you. Would, would you guys find it useful to see some aerial photographs of other Copart facilities? It'll only take a second. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. This is new to me too, so <laughs> bear with me. I should, should just take a second. Um, I'm already getting better at it. There we go. Um, so let me see. So let's, I am sharing the screen. Okay, that's, there we go. Here's one in Vallejo. You can, you can see that administrative building in this car storage just uh, looks like a parking lot by and large. The number of employees at each facility kind of varies based on what um, administrative functions they're provided, but um, are providing. Here's the Copart Sacramento facility. 
and here is the Copart Martinez facility. So in essence, it, you know, these, they basically operate as a large parking lot with an administrative office function up front. Um, uh, very clean operations. Um, and here is the Copart, uh, the vehicles they use that would be stored on site um, in a portion of the restored building, remodeled building. You can see these front loaders use these uh, forks to off and onload the vehicles so they're not driven on site. They're just taken off the vehicle when they arrive, inspected, and then moved to their assigned location in the yard and then taken off and loaded uh, via the same process. So um, with that, I think that unless you have any other questions, uh, that's all we really have for you. Um, we just like to say thank you and we respectfully request that you uh, follow the staff's recommendation to approve the mitigated negative deck and MMRP and uh, the conditional use permit. Um, but we're here and available to answer any questions you may have. I had one you. further. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Commissioner Wong. Thank you. Um, is it the Copart business model that for the sale of the car that normally they're not local customers or is it local customers who come to pick up? the cars? How do they take delivery typically? Yeah, transport, transported to wherever the end user or the buyer is, they don't come to the facility and pick up the car themselves. Jeremy, can you elaborate on that? Yes, that is correct. The, the time that we would see someone from the public would be to um, pick up their title and pay for their unit and arrange for transport, whether it be um, us providing not a service ourselves, but a third party uh, contact to help transport that vehicle or um, th the end user arranging the transport for themselves with a third party. So they view the inventory online and then make arrangements. That is correct. Yes. Thank you. Any other commission questions for the applicant at this time? Not seeing any movement, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, well, first thank you for the applicant for sharing presentation, greatly appreciate it. Um, we're gonna move on to public comment. I have something I'm supposed to read here. Um, so we are moving on to public comment for item 2.1, which is to consider a resolution to approve a mitigated negative declaration and a conditional use permit for a Copart automotive storage facility on two parcels totaling 20 acres. Um, as a reminder, if you wish to make a comment on this item, please Nicole N. Jones at cityofamericancanyon.org and she will call you during public comment period. You can also call directly into 707-647-4348. I do have one comment that was submitted to me. I'm gonna go ahead and read this into the record for everybody. Uh, this came from a gentleman by the name of Nick Roman. Uh, my name is Nick. We own a property up to the north um, of 2500 Green Island Road, the one next to it, 2480. Unfortunately, we learned today that the city does not require, is not requiring Copart to recondition the part of the road from M&M Sanitation to their new proposed location. Uh, this fact upsets us and all of our neighbors. The sublot that Copart has right now at 2744 has about 600 spaces and their tow trucks make, us, make severe damage to the road already. The city will allow Copart to bring in 5,000, 5,000 vehicles like they propose, it will destroy our road entirely. How will Copart in the city of American Canyon address these issues? Uh, thank you, Nick Roman. That's one comment. I'm not seeing, Nicole, do we have anything other? No, Chairman, we do not have any other public comment at this time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close public comment. If more comes in, we can reopen at that point in time. So I'm closing public comment. We're gonna move on to commissioner comments. Any comments on the commissions that have not been made at this point in time? 
Um, where I'm just going to call out names to make it easier. We're going to start with Commissioner Malari. I'm good. Thank you. And no comments there, Commissioner Navarro. Uh, I uh, I have no comments this time. Thank you. Commissioner Wong. Um, I have no comments just to say thank you to Tricia and Copart for this thorough presentation and for answering all of our questions. I have no further comments at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Altman. I will echo Commissioner Wong and uh, thank both staff and the applicant for a uh, job well done. Um, pretty darn thorough uh, presentation. Um, and I'm, I'm good for now. Thank you. Um, and I just have one question, just because of my own curiosity. Uh, as I'm reading through, I noticed the the eight foot fencing that's going around the entire perimeter of the um, of the project. And I also noted electric fencing on the inside. Can I just get a little explanation on the need for the electric fencing and its purpose, and how high up that will go? And um, would you like me to respond to that, mm -hmm. um, Commissioner or Chair? Sure, please. Okay, so it's an eight foot. So in the front, we've got the wrought iron uh, kind of see through, you can see through it and see the, but on those uh, other three sides, you have this solid eight foot metal fence. On the inside of that is an electric series of wires. That's a security fence. So, and on the outside of the metal um, solid fencing are uh, warning signs that indicate to anyone that is interested in trying to climb over or to somehow penetrate the fence and get into the facility that uh, there it's an electrified security fence and so if they were able to penetrate through the metal eight foot fencing and um, they would encounter an electrical fence that if touched or triggered would send an alarm out to the authorities that this offense had been breached and um, alert them so that they could arrive in a timely fashion to address uh, any such encroachment. And this is used throughout Copart's facilities. Uh, Jeremy, if you want to provide some additional color to that or information that you might think is useful. Yeah, I think you, you touched on all the uh... Major point. One thing to note, though, for this particular site, it's been discussed internally to um, not move forward with what we call an alarm fence, and that's based on that the front fence will be decorative, um, and where the R panel fencing on the remaining three sides, you can't see in or out of it. Um, so I think internally we've discussed it makes more sense. We've started to use uh, thermal facial recognition cameras as well, um, so that that. Okay. It, most likely the direction for this site that we'll go into being that the alarm fence is not that attractive to look at if you could uh, see it through the front edge there. All right, thank you. Um, that's the only question I have. Um, no other commissions. Are there any actions for commission members? I will make a motion to adopt a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon, California, approving a conditional use permit for a Copart automotive storage facility on two parcels, totaling 20 acres located at 1660 and 1578 Green Island Road in the General Industrial GI Zoning District, APN 058-070-019 and 058-070-020. File number PL 18-0019. Uh, there's also a, a resolution to adopt the mitigated negative declaration. Um, yeah. Oh, I missed that. There we go. Yeah, and that should come first, actually. So thank you. So let me uh, do that as well. I will make a uh, additional motion to adopt a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of American Canyon, California. One, adopting the initial study and mitigated negative declaration for a Copart automotive storage facility on two parcels totaling, totaling 20 acres located at 1660 and 1578 Green Island Road 
in the General Industrial GI Zoning District, two, adopting the Mitigated Monitoring and Reporting Program, and three, directing staff to file a Notice of Determination, APNs 058-070-019 and 058-070-020, file number PL 18-0019. Job. We have a I'll second. second the motion. Okay, Commissioner Altman. Aye. Commissioner Malari. Aye. Commissioner Wong. Aye. Vice Chairman Navarro. Aye. Chairman Gaw. Aye. Okay, that was the negative negative mitigated mitigation. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Thank you. Conditional use permit was that addressed? Um, it needs to be separately voted, but mm -hmm. uh, the motion was made okay, so for it, so Altman? I think we need a second on it. Yeah, we need a second on that. We need a second. I'll second the motion. Okay. So, Commissioner Altman. Aye. Commissioner Malari. Aye. Commissioner Wong. Aye. Vice Chairman Navarro. Aye. Chairman Gall. Aye. All right, thank you everybody. In relation to item 2.1, we're gonna move down the agenda to item 2.2. Um, for those of you who would like to exit at this time, would be a great opportunity. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to Tricia. She's been working with us for a while now, several years, and really appreciate her hard work on this project. And appreciate the cooperation of the applicant. Uh, we made a lot of working together, made a lot of improvements to the project and appreciate it. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. So we just sign off right now. Is that how this works? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Bye. <laughs> See you. All right. We're going to move on to agenda item 2.2. Consider a resolution, a resolution to approve a design permit for a new 201,950 square foot warehouse distribution e-commerce building with accessory parking space on a 58.02 acre portion of the 173 acre Napa Logistics Park phase two project site located in Napa County industrial area specific plan file number PL20-0013. Hmm. We have a staff a, report. William, he has a presentation for you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Does everybody see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah. All right, good evening, uh, Chair Goff, uh, members of the Planning Commission, and uh, members of the public uh, from wherever you guys are watching. Uh, my name is William, I'm with the Planning Division. I'm very happy to be here today to give a presentation on the Napa Logistics Park um, Phase 2 Building 3 Design Permit. So uh, just to orient everyone, the project location is south of the airport. Uh, it's the lot right between Napa Logistics Building 4 and Building 1. It's accessible from Highway 29 via South Kelly Road and, and Devlin Road. And it's, it's a very large uh, um, general, it's, it's a, in the SP zone for the Napa Airport Industrial uh, Area. Here is a graphic of the Napa Logistics Park overall, um, both phase one and phase two. Uh, phase one was the uh, building one, which consists of the 646,000 square foot building, which later became the uh, distribution center for IKEA. And phase two consists of 173 acres, uh, which has four lots and a remainder. Um, this project building three consists of lots two and three combined together, uh, which makes up the 58 acre parcel that's highlighted in red here. Uh, building three will have just one building, 201,950 uh, square feet, uh, which was reduced from the, from the previous 
the idea of a 1 million square foot building. So, so building three uh, will be a smaller building. It's actually gonna be the, the smallest building of, of the four buildings here, but I think it's actually on the biggest lot. So um, here is a close up of the site plan. Uh, I've rotated it to make it uh, easier for viewing. So north is on the left side now. And uh, the, the site itself is, um, uh, has three access points from Middleton Way and three access points from Boone Drive. Uh, the building is in the middle, shown in brown, uh, 201,000 square feet. And it has um, the, a lot of um, vehicle storage, uh, van storage, because it's a um, e-commerce facility. And it, those are shown in yellow. And then the employee and visitors parking is shown in blue. Um, the project meets all the um, uh, zoning uh, and design standards as uh, explained in the staff report. And it's, um, its building height is 50 feet. So here is a, um, a closer look at the building elevation. This is the east and west elevation. The building uh, consists of three major colors, white, white brown, and uh, blue the trims. And in the southern uh, side of it, um, there is a, uh, the highest point of the building is 50 feet, and it has a four foot parapet to screen any mechanical uh, equipment on the roof. And then here's the other two sides of the building, north and south. The north side faces the airport and that's where um, the uh, truck loading docks are. And then the south side is the main entry. Uh, there is a um, additional features for the office in the southwest corner. There is a central entrance in, in the middle of, south, of the southern side. And then um, all of the, the bottom floor of the southern side is covered with like storefront like windows that really gives it a a modern business park look. Um, there are two extended canopies on the uh, on two sides of the building and that's going to help um, uh, sh shade vehicles from um, the sun and rain. This is how um, the building looks overall uh, as a photo simulation of the southwest corner here and um, as I mentioned it's it's a uh, 50 feet tall and the the view from the, the the front yard setback is about I think 58 to 60 feet away so there's a lot of landscaping and um, parking screening before you even see the, the building so and talking about landscaping they had a very robust and comprehensive uh, landscaping plan about 30 pages altogether but I just want to give you the highlights um, the landscaping for the site will be about 846,000 square feet, uh, approximately 35% of the site, which is above and beyond the minimum requirement of 15%. Uh, landscaping will consist of 795 trees. Uh, they'll be placed in the setbacks, some circulation areas, and um, within the employee parking lot. And of, of the trees, um, and shrubs, they will comply with our water efficient landscaping ordinance. And of those, um, of all the tree species, three of them uh, that are most abundant will be the Deodor cedar, the cork oak, and the Zalkova village green. Uh, from what I read, the cedars grows pretty fast and the cork oak and the Zalkova has wide canopies that can really help screen the building from afar. I wanted to go over some of the, uh, the CEQA determination. Um, this site is part of, Nash, of the Napa Logistics Park, uh, which was approved in the 2015 uh, by the city council. And it, it came with an environmental impact report. Um, this building, building three, um, will incorporate all of the applicable mitigation measures from the Napa Logistics EIR. And I do want to talk a little bit about the traffic impact. It's going to be a great reduction because um, the building is being uh, reduced from 1 million square feet 
to 201,000 square feet. And overall, the total number of trips for all of Napa Logistics Park uh, will be 5,655, which is gonna be a 39% reduction than what was projected in the 2015 EIR. I could just add one little comment too. Um, the, when the project was approved, it was approved with a number of traffic mitigation measures with traffic um, management um, concepts, uh, including off-peak shift change and a very robust trip monitoring program. And that was all intended to keep it within the 9263 overall trips. And uh, here we are with the uh, build out of the project with a, a much greatly reduced traffic impact overall. So I think it's, it's, it's pretty significant from a reduction from, from what was approved. But even then, there were a lot of progressive ideas and trip monitoring that were incorporated into the project. Thanks, Willie. I'll let you, I'll let you go take on from there. And that, that's right. And, you know, with less trips, there's going to be less GHG generated from all that. So um, I think that goes into my recommendation. Um, it complies with all the design guidelines for our general plan. It complies with the standards in the Napa, uh, Napa Airport Industrial Specific Plan, and it complies with CEQA. And that's why staff's recommendation is to approve the Building 3 design permit. Um, it was a pretty short presentation, but the applicant is here. The applicant's tenant is, is here. And I know they have some, something to share with you today. So I'll be here if you have any questions, but for now, um, I, I would like to turn it over to the applicant. Thank you, William. Uh, my name's Ernie Nodell with Orchard Partners. Um, I've been before this body a few times, so uh, I'm glad to be back and thank you uh, commissioners for uh, looking at our presentation here today. Um, I'm excited to be sitting in front of you uh, asking for your uh, approval of our design permit. This is actually going to be the final building in our uh, business park. Um, let me share with you uh, a screen that William had up just a short while ago. This is the, uh, the business park as it has now uh, developed. And as William mentioned, we have IKEA in our first building. Uh, this is their first dedicated uh, customer distribution center, which is part of their e-commerce platform. Uh, over two buildings over is our largest building to date. It's 702,000 square feet. It's currently under construction and just nearing completion in the next uh, two months. We have a tenant occupying the north half of that uh, particular, that will be uh, occupying the north half of that building. And that tenant is going to require rail for part of their business. And so we're in the process of bringing rail. It'll kind of loop around the uh, north part of the site here coming off the main line, uh, the main UP line uh, that is uh, uh, between uh, the transfer station and our project. Uh, and then we'll come up right alongside the building and they'll be able to load rail cars uh, with the, their products uh, to be distributed nationally. And then finally, we have uh, what we refer to as Building 5, uh, which you approved for design permit last year. Uh, we've been in the process of uh, getting our building permit. It is imminently going to be issued and then that building will uh, shortly be under construction. So today um, we, we are coming uh, with this particular project, which is a really important project. But uh, with any of these types of uh, business parks, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure that's involved in making sure that the park is going to work, that it's going to work for the city, that we uh, undertake to mitigate any uh, environmental impacts. And as you know from uh, past discussions and meetings, um, we had a very robust uh, uh, environmental impact review on this particular project. Knowing that our target audience is, uh, is world-class businesses, uh, much of what will be in the growing e-commerce uh, arena, and uh, so we wanted to be ensure uh, we wanted to ensure that we were. Uh, uh, 
studying this to a degree where uh, we took the maximum uh, potential and uh, and here we are today uh, we're not we're not going to impact environmentally anywhere near what we projected and so this makes it very easy for us to come to you and say okay here we are this is this is now going to be the completion of our project. But as far as infrastructure is concerned, uh, there are a few things that we have done, a few things that we have left to do, and we're working very closely with the city to get those things completed. Uh, but I just wanted to very quickly list them. Uh, we had constructed a bridge over No Name Creek. This is already built. Uh, it's going to service the uh, Building 5 uh, site. We built a bridge over No Name Creek so as to not impact its normal flows. Uh, and then uh, we are just in the process of completing the construction of Boone Drive. Boone Drive is this southerly uh, road and then it turns northward uh, to a cul-de-sac. And you will see this week uh, and next week it's being paved and it will be completed along with the roundabout that we agreed to build uh, for the city at this location and then the connector for Devlin Road uh, that goes to the roundabout. Uh, this is part of the uh, last segment of Devlin Road that is now going to go down towards uh, Green or, or connect to Green Island Road. So we've done our part to get all of this ready. Uh, we are uh, just about finished building this portion of it. Uh, and then over in the northwest corner of the site, we have uh, nearly 38 acres that is set aside as a wetland preserve. Uh, and this was some existing wetlands, as well as the ability to create additional wetlands and wetland enhancements. And that was partly for some small areas within our site that we needed to mitigate uh, and be able to fill some existing wetlands. But more importantly, we recently completed the mitigation of uh, some wetlands that is going to allow the city to uh, complete uh, their permits for Dublin Road and Green Island Road widening, where they're uh, going to be impacting a few wetlands. And we had agreed to provide all of the mitigation necessary to allow them to get their permits from, uh, from the various agencies. So that work is done. Uh, this year, we are going to be starting construction on a very brand new uh, sanitary sewer pump station in the Green Island Business Park. This pump station uh, is necessary to uh, provide appropriate uh, sanitary sewer service for our, our development, but it also will be uh, a, uh, have the capacity to take on all the other ex or other potentially future uh, uh, developments throughout this area of uh, American Canyon and will pr provide improved sewer service for the entire uh, Green Island Business Park. So that we are undertaking this year and should be completed early next year. Uh, and um, we are also going to be bringing recycled water in. We're working with the City Public Works uh, as part of the Devlin Road extension. We are going to be paying for a uh, recycled water connection, which will then provide recy recycled water for everything north of uh, American, uh, pardon me, uh, north of Green Island Road. And then finally, uh, we have been engineering several improvements for South Kelly Road and the uh, intersection at Highway 29. Uh, you will have see another application later on today. There's a uh, uh, one of our, our friendly uh, competitors is uh, developing a business park there, and they're going to be dedicating some land to help the widening of South Kelly Road. And we're uh, set and ready to work with Public Works to get those improvements completed as quickly as we can, along with uh, improvements along Highway 29. So uh, we are anxious to uh, keep uh, keep those things moving forward. Get this, uh, get all of these improvements completed as we're building out our park here. Um, so today we are here for building three. Uh, we require design permit approvals so that we can uh, obtain our building permits. Uh, we have every intention to start this project this summer. Uh, it's going to take approximately a year to construct. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our uh, tenant for 
this particular project, uh, Mark De Bourbon. Ernie, thank you. Uh, Commissioners of American Canyon, my name is Mark De Bourbon. Uh, can can you all hear me, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Very good. I apologize. I'm having a little bit of a computer issue. Uh, I can visually see everything, but the audio is not working, so I'm dialing it from my cell phone of 510-343-4342. Uh, again, everyone, my name is Mark De Bourbon, and I, uh, I work as a senior program manager for Amazon uh, out of Seattle, but I am based in California, a home in the Bay Area, and also up in the gold country where I'm currently stationed, given the crazy world that we're living in. Um, the the, the, the project in front of you is an Amazon last mile delivery station. And uh, if I could uh, uh, walk you through uh, the Amazon delivery cycle, if you will, or a, uh, a chain of that, I'd like to politely pick on Chairman Goff, if I could. Chairman Goff, are you by any chance an Amazon customer? I've been known to occasionally order through your services, <laughs> yes. Well, I appreciate that, sir. Thanks for keeping me with the job. I, I appreciate that. Chairman Goff, you go on to Amazon's website, and yesterday your toaster had broken, and you, you just you don't want to go down to the local store to buy that. You want to go on Amazon.com and purchase the Turbo 3000 model toaster. You go onto Amazon's website and you order that toaster. That order goes into an Amazon fulfillment center. The Amazon fulfillment center is somewhere between a million and a half to three million square feet where more than 30 million different products are housed. That toaster is pulled off the shelf, placed in a box, sealed up. A label is printed out with your name and address on it. It is loaded onto a 53-foot line haul truck along with thousands of other products, and it's delivered to an Amazon sortation center. At the Amazon sortation center level, those are buildings anywhere between four and 900,000 square feet where the products come in and a bunch of smart people up in Seattle have figured out algorithms of how do I get that toaster to Chairman Goff's home as quickly, cost-effectively, and as efficiently as possible. Now, there's one of three ways to do that. We have uh, our outside carriers, the United States Postal Service. We have UPS. And we also have a third way, Amazon Logistics, which is what this building we're talking about would, would then service. If it's determined that Amazon Logistics, Chairman Goff, can get that toaster to your house as, as cost-effectively and as efficiently and as quickly as possible, it leaves the sortation center for this uh, station on, on at 300 Boone Drive, which is the Amazon last mile delivery. That product or that, uh, that toaster is brought in on a 53 foot line haul truck along with thousands of other product or products on that delivered to that station generally overnight where it is inbound, brought into the station, unloaded, sorted based on zip codes, placed onto rollable baker's racks, think of it like a five and a half to six foot baker's rack, uh, based on zip codes and sorted overnight, completing that sortation around 6 a.m. in the morning. In the morning, starting around 9 a.m., our delivery van drivers show up in their personal vehicles, go through in the morning our safety stand-up uh, presentations and, and meetings for about a half an hour. The driver DSP companies, then they go off to their vans and or they, they, they pull the racks out to their vans. They load up the vans to part in waves. Uh, we have two different waves departing here. The first wave would leave around 10 a.m. And I point out 10 a.m. because we are a five-year-old business now. Uh, when I first started back in January of 2016, we had eight delivery stations. Now we're at about 240 uh, throughout the country and, and growing that exponentially year over year. And we've had several learnings over that five years as a new business, uh, 
one of the things we've learned throughout the various jurisdictions throughout the country is that they're very sensitive to our traffic and the 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning uh, commuter peak rush hour and the 4 to 6 in the evening rush hour as well. And jurisdictions were concerned about our impact uh, affecting your constituents and what have you. We are now departing the vans or starting our first rollout of the vans at 10 a.m. in the morning and completing that by 1130. The vans then go out for an eight to 10 hour shift starting to roll back in around uh, 7, 7 p.m. at night. Again, avoiding the four to six in the evening. Uh, the drivers then go out and deliver throughout the area. As they return, they park their vans, clock out, and get into their personal vehicles and go home. The operation, and hopefully uh, Chairman Goff, that toaster got to you in the same amount of time frame that we promised it to you, hopefully the next day. Um, I call this operation a 24-7 operation because several different things happen. I'll start the clock, let's say, at midnight when, in the, or the overnight hours, if you will, as the packages are being inbound, they're being sorted they're being loaded into the vans in the morning. The vans then go out during the day to deliver the product. They then return to the station in the early evening. Line hauls are coming in for the next day's delivery as well. So it's a continual 24-hour seven, seven uh, operation, but again, with different functions inside of that delivery life cycle. The inbounding of the product, the sortation of it based on zip codes, and the delivery of that. So basically we call this the last mile delivery station trying to deliver these products and packages to our customers to your constituents as quickly as efficiently and as cost effectively as possible that's sort of uh, it in a nutshell but i'd certainly be happy to answer any questions that the uh that the commissioners have We'll get into commission questions here in a second. If there's anything else you have to add before we go there? No, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. And William, were you done? Uh, that's it for me, too. And then we're going to uh, go quickly to any commissioner questions for either William or the applicant at this point in time. Uh, again, I'm just going to call out since it seems to be easier for me. We're going to start with. Uh, Mr. Navarro? Uh, just so uh, that was a, a good presentation of the use of that building. And so um, you're projecting that's going to take place, uh, probably start up in operation next summer. Is I wasn't clear of uh, the operate the hours of operation. This is a 24 seven or um, especially in terms of traffic. Is our trucks rolling in and out um, every single day? Yeah, well, it, and allow me to make that distinction, Commissioner Navarro. It is a, a personal vehicle, uh, a, a regular car for our van drivers, for our overnight sortation associates and our managers at the station. They are uh, delivery vans. Uh, we call them sprinter vans. Uh, you may have seen them out on the street, maybe branded with Amazon from other locations if you've been out there, but they are, uh, again, two axle vehicles. And then also we have our line hauler, 53 foot, people call them semi trucks, right? Like we call them line hauls in, in, in the Amazon vernacular. Uh -huh. But uh, there's a combination of those three different types of vehicles coming and going from this facility. So when do the large trucks, the line hauls come come in are th those are coming in at um I i'm just concerned if they are coming in around peak times as well they are not sir uh the, the majority of them uh and i'm looking at my uh my uh, a a, a uh, mock-up if you will a pro forma of a schedule we are mm -hmm. looking at somewhere between 25 and 30 53 foot line holes coming in in a 24-hour period the majority of those come in starting around 9 p.m. at night, and we have them running all the way through till about 4.30 in the morning. The last ones come in, and they're all staggered, if you will. Uh, they're, they're spread out over that time frame. There will be 
a few coming in during the day. Right now on my schedule, I'm just showing one coming in at 7 a.m. Nothing coming in in the evening, uh, 4 to 6 p.m. peak commuter hours. Okay. Thank you. And, and how many uh, uh, employees are coming in and uh, uh, driving in their vehicles and then taking off in the sprinters? Well, those are what we call our, our DSP or delivery service provider. Uh, they are a uh, third party company that we hire. We'll probably at this station hire somewhere between eight and 10 of those different companies. Uh, each of those companies will hire anywhere between 30 to 60 drivers, have 30 to 60 delivery routes, delivery vans in their, in their network. Mm -hmm. They all bring in their own managers as well. Now those third party delivery van drivers, they're dedicated solely to the operation of Amazon. They don't deliver or do anything else for any other company. They're there solely for Amazon. Uh, a little bit of an entrepreneurial uh, wing there where you have a, a team that comes in, a little company that comes in that can, last year Amazon purchased about 100,000 Mercedes Sprinter vans mm -hmm. uh, and got a very nice uh, bulk rate on that. Um, we can pass those savings along to our, our DSP providers to keep the cost down of, these, of the delivery of these products. Um, but again, on that front, those employees, we're looking at somewhere between 275 to 300 ebbs and flows through the cycle, but somewhere between 275 and 300, uh, delivery vans, uh, delivering for us on a steady state basis. We then can turn around and talk about our sortation associates, Amazon, what we call Amazon blue badges or Amazon employees. Again, those numbers go up and down with an operation like this, depending on volume. But on a pro forma basis, I'm looking at somewhere around 250 sortation associates on a steady state basis throughout the times, primarily coming in overnight. But we'll also have some uh, a uh, some sort some sortation going on in the in the in the uh, in the general during the day. Um, Sometimes Amazon can get a same day delivery out to our, one of our customers. We're perfecting and getting better and better at timing. Um, Chairman Goff, again, if you're a uh, Amazon customer, hopefully you've, you've gotten your packages when we've promised them and, and hopefully next day or the day after that. But again, Amazon would like to get their, their packages to customers when promised and again, as quickly as possible. Um, we then also have uh, some managers, if you will, of the building. I suspect we'll have somewhere between 25 and 35 managers for a facility of this size. So all in all, it's an aggregate, if you will, of our delivery van drivers, uh, the DSP companies that come there and, and, and uh, provide our delivery service for us, and our overnight sortation associates, some during the day, but primarily overnight, and also our Amazon managers, if you will, that manage throughout the 24 cycle cycle shift, various uh, various functions as well throughout throughout the uh, again the 24 hour shift. Hey Mark, just to chime in real quick, uh, if you're done with your presentation, can you stop the screen share? Uh, I am not screen sharing right now. I think Ernie is, and he's showing oh. up what we call. <laughs> And I'm happy okay. to do that. I can, I can talk about the site plan if you'd like and kind of speak to it, how it functions and how the flow goes and, and where the loading takes place and how the vans depart. Okay. Uh, again, when I talked about, you know, 250 vans, again, we do not release those vans all in one, uh, one shot. Uh, starting at 10 o'clock, running through around 1030, we'll send out our first wave, about 160 vans. They're loaded on both sides of the building and they depart in, in waves. Uh, the first one is 160 between 10 and 1030. And then the second shift comes in from a queuing area. And if you can see in that, uh, in, that di or in the diagram, the vans that are lined up closest to the building is where we load from the building. And then the queuing, if you will, is the next level out on each side where we have our vans queued up and drivers in the vehicles not idling. Uh, once the wave of the first van departs from against the building, they go out onto the uh, streets of Greater American Canyon. The next wave comes in from the queuing area. 
to load and then we get them out between 10, 30 and 11. And that second wave is about 130, I would say, that go out in that second wave. So those are the two waves of departures. Thinking again, we don't want to impact or clog the streets, even though we are out of the peak hour, rush hour traffic, you know, throwing out 270, 280 vans all at once, we'll, you know, it's tough logistically to get those out of the park. So we want to stagger our distribution or the, the release of those vans onto the street. We have yard marshals out there that direct the traffic. Safety is absolutely paramount. Number one to Amazon. Uh, I, I never want anybody hurt at, at, at any of our stations or anywhere out there with our drivers. So it's all very much controlled and again, released in waves. Uh, yard marshals pointing to the vans you this wave goes that wave goes they're not it's not just a free-for-all everybody trying to get out through through the uh points of, of uh egress um it, it's it's very well managed out there in the uh in the parking lot in the loading areas in the distribution zones okay thank you and i apologize commissioner navarro uh i gave you a long-winded answer and then i i wrapped around something else but you were asking questions and I apologize for, di yeah, for diverting. I appreciate it. It's, it's fine. Thank you very much. Chairman Laurie, do you have any questions? Um, just with so much of the, the high traffic or the vans and the personal vehicles and the merchandise, um, can you talk about how security is, um, you know, with a facility of this nature? I'm sorry, could I talk about what, please? I missed that. The, the, uh, security um, and how, you know, with all, with all the merchandise and the vehicles that operate essentially, right? But um, can you elaborate on oh, like, what um, kind of security you have? Sure, well, there, uh, we, don't, we, we don't have quote unquote security guards or things like that. The, the story here on, on the products coming in, they are, they are under the roof at the facility for such a, a short period of time. This isn't a warehousing of these products. It is the inbounding of them, the sortation of them. They are likely, if, if let's say I'll start the clock at you know, a, a midnight shift, if you will, a product comes in, it's sorted. There's so many people in the building uh, sorting and, 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 and continuing to build up these baker's racks, if you will, until we're finished in the early morning to get that first main wave out. Um, there, are, there are always employees in the building, uh, generally by around 11 o'clock. All of the day's packages have, the, 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 the majority of them, I should say, by 11 o'clock have left the building. Again, there may be some same day products that come in. It's the line hall may come in at noontime or one o'clock with a half load of same day products to get out there as well, or in the early evening or what have you. Uh, we also have something called Amazon Flex. An Amazon Flex driver is uh, uh, a, a much like the Uber program, although we think we're a lot better. A, an individual can bring their personal vehicle onto the site. They sign up through an Amazon app. Uh, they have a scheduled time when to arrive, and they can uh, cube out their personal vehicle and deliver for three to four hours from uh, for us uh, with a GPS device built into their phone that optimizes their route. We like to use our flex drivers a lot for our same day deliveries as they come in in the middle afternoon and takes them about 15 minutes to load up a, a regular car and out they go as well. Again, it's all scheduled. Uh, you set up an appointment, you come at, let's say three o'clock in the afternoon, you're, the, you're out by 3.15, 3.20, and you're out delivering for three to four hours for us as well. Um, again, there, there's always activity and uh, some, some people are in the building at all times. But again, it's not a long-term storage or uh, or, or a uh, housing facility, if you will, of any of our products. Okay. The goal here is to get that product inbounded and out the door as quickly as possible. Okay, perfect, understood. And um, with the, um, let's see, I had a, a thought in here. Uh, with the amount of employees that will be in there, is this, uh, are you guys looking to hire or you guys have employees already in mind that are going to be like transplanted, you know, from other facilities? 
No, not at all. These will all be new hires. And generally, we've had okay. job fairs and hiring at the facility or, or hiring, you know, again, with economic development folks within any given jurisdiction. But given the, the crazy world that we live in now on COVID-19, we're doing a lot of interviewing uh, through our, uh, our a, through a website and having online interviews for both sortation associates, the hiring of DSP companies, managers, things like that. These will all be new hires here. Uh, we need our employees at every facility we have in the Bay Area. So uh, we'll be looking to hire all net new people here. Perfect. And how many facilities do we, got, do we have in the Bay Area? How many, I'm sorry, was your question, how many stations do we have in the Bay Area? Yeah. Um, good question. Let me just think off the top of my head, mostly because I've selected most of them. Uh, off top. <laughs> one, yeah, I'm going to say probably six. I'll take it. It's going down as far as, let's say, close to San Jose, not quite that far, maybe Milpitas. San Leandro, Richmond. Uh, we have some in the peninsula as well. Um, always challenging in the Bay Area, of course, but again, we're trying to open more and more as we uh, Livermore, uh, places like that, even out as far as Tracy, trying to open more and more. So right now I'd say six in the Bay Area. I'd like to grow that uh, as well, but uh, you know, we're making efforts to do that. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, we have well over 200 stations now and again in the next five years you know we talk about going to over a thousand so across the country we're trying to grow our network and the idea behind that is we think we can deliver it deliver a product and a package uh, better than our our uh, our outside carriers if you will UPS and the US Postal Service that toaster that I referenced earlier to Commissioner Goff or Chairman Goff um, if that toaster doesn't show up to his house or it shows up late, uh, he doesn't really care how it got delivered. All he knows is that Amazon let him down and didn't get that toaster when it was promised. I have very little quality control when I deal with UPS or the U.S. Postal Service, but if I'm delivering that product or that package through my network, I have much better control over that. So uh, we want to be the A to Z uh, provider business that, Chairman Goff orders that toaster from, he orders it from Amazon.com. I'd like to place that package on his doorstep. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Altman. Thank you, Chair Goff. Um, I've got a few questions. I'm gonna start giving uh, Commissioner Mallory's questions and ask, um, and I know it's not directly related here, but it's for my curiosity. Are there any local hiring requirements or goals um, that, you know, uh, that have been set um, so that American Canyon residents uh, who may be in need of uh, better employment can find it? Well, I'd be very happy to put that uh, to, uh, I have an economic development business partner. Again, in the wor weird world of COVID-19, uh, we before COVID-19, we would have uh, job fairs, if you will, within a jurisdiction or advertise that we're hiring at the station, uh, maybe come to one of our other facilities uh, to sit down and interview and what have you. But we'd be more, we, we actually encourage, we would, we would prefer to have American Canyon uh, your constituents there with those jobs. And what I could do is put you in contact uh, with our, uh, our uh, my, my economic development individual, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Meduli Williams, who can uh, point in a direction of how to apply for one of these jobs when the time comes up. And we'd be certainly happy to partner with anyone at American Canyon. Uh, American Canyon has an econ dev person or a a, uh, a person that deals with those kind of things, uh, we, we, we'd be more than happy to provide information, something that you can uh, put up maybe on your website and direct people to the website to apply for a job here. Good, that, that's great. Um, so give, given your comments, if we were to uh, add a um, approval condition 
for a local hiring requirement, I take it there would be no objection on your end. Well, I don't know if I could, uh, I, I would ask for or, or, or uh, talk about a, a local, again, it's, it's challenging to keep that in that zone. I'd rather put that with our economic development person, but I can certainly assure you that, um, you know, we would make every effort to advertise this facility opening at the right time and have those folks work with, work with you there. Um, a requirement I feel that if what if you know given the size of this, I didn't have enough applicants uh, or didn't not enough qualified people to to take these jobs. I hate to use the word qualified, but let's just say enough applicants out of American Canyon. Where could I go then to get employees to 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 uh, run this station and to operate this station mm -hmm. for us? I I, can, I will tell you this that we will work in our very best faith to hire American mm -hmm. Canyon residents and again, advertise it uh, through any kind of uh, advertising uh, through, the, through the city or through American Canyon to encourage people from American Canyon to, uh, to, to apply. But again, I'd like to leave that in my swim lane of my business partner at our economic development who will have more on that. And, and if, I, if I may, uh, 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 Commissioner uh, Altman, uh, we have been very conscious to connect our, our tenants and the users within the park, uh, particularly with the American Canyon Chamber of Commerce, who have been a great partner working uh, with everybody in trying to fill jobs and, uh, you know, uh, partnering up with uh, local businesses. Uh, and, and we always make those connections. But it's, uh, it's obvious that, uh, you know, they're uh, first and foremost, uh, want to give those opportunities to those that live close to the facility. Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, it does a few things in terms of uh, traffic mitigation issues. It goes a long way um, if people are local. Um, and it's, you know, what we've done in the past, from my recollection, and Mr. Mm -hmm. Nodell, you, you know, I have uh, been around for a bit um, and seen you on a few <laughs> things, including the original um, approval of the uh, the million square foot uh, building. Um, and uh, we, we have not, when we've done this kind of thing about making it a condition, it's not, you know, it's, it's a reasonable approach. It's not a, you must hire X number of American Canyon residents. Um, you know, given that, that the details are on that are not my area of expertise, let me um, kind of throw it out there to uh, either or both of um, our city attorney, uh, Mr. Ross, or uh, Mr. Cooper, our um, uh, planning director, uh, for any comments in terms of um, doing something like a, uh, you know, um, condition for local hiring uh, as part of the resolution. Uh, I'll comment first. Um, that's within the authority of the city to require that. Um, plain and simple. And when we've done it, we, you know, it, it's been a pretty reasonable requirement because we have done it in the past, correct? We have put it in some conditions in the past, yes. You know, there's a best effort standard, but also it's related to goals that are uh, set forth even in the old general plan about encouraging economic activity within the city. So it would be an element of general plan consistency even under the old plan. Okay. Commissioner Altman, it's again Mark DeBourbon, if I may. I, yes. I can tell you that we will make every effort to hire American Canyon residents. It's in our best interest as well. We want people local and, and again, not having to travel and drive uh, terribly far to get to our facility here. Uh, it makes for happier employees. I will tell you, though, that in my experience in the last three or four months doing this, we are adjusting and changing quite a bit in the COVID-19 world. I mean, previously when we would have job fairs, I mean, that was something we would gladly do. I would absolutely agree that, you know, the first hiring session, we'd have it at the American Canyon High School or at City Hall or in a conference room somewhere or even at the, you know, at a different facility, something even just to participate there locally. But again, keeping maintaining Amazon social distancing and the, and, and the rules behind that, which I'd be happy to speak to if anybody had any questions on that. Um, 
it's all being done on you know online right now with online interviews and, and video Zoom conferences with people that we are hiring. So uh, again, I, I I can I can assure you to, to put in something that says Amazon will use best efforts or reasonable efforts to hire locally. Uh, I just think given the weird, weird world we're living in and changes that happen all the time, um, it's just very challenging for us to have those kind of customary job fairs, uh, hosting them locally on site or at a, at a location in American Canyon to offer that. Previously, we've done that, but I just think that I've got a lot of touchy people uh, with that. Uh, and again, it's not to hide the ball in any way, shape, or form. I can assure you we prefer to hire locally. And we'll make okay, every well, effort to do that, given our, given our, given our state of the world. Well, uh, so, so your comments lead me to ask a couple of questions. Um, when do you start hiring for a facility? Generally, it's about three months before we open. I hope uh, my business partner at Orchards, uh, Mr. Nodell, can deliver this, hopefully this time next year. I would probably start hiring 90 days prior. Okay, so... As, as we start hitting certain thresholds in the building, as it's being finished up, and as I have my teams come in and do our fit-outs and our little TI work and things like that, there's a certain threshold approximately 90 days prior to us opening where we will start that process. Right. So, so the hope would be that in roughly nine months from now is what we're talking using the scenario you laid out um, opening in about a year, hiring 90 days in advance, that puts us nine months or so from today. Uh, we'll be dealing with a bit of a different COVID-19 um, circumstance than we are today. Uh, hopefully, in an ideal world, there will be a vaccine. I'm not betting on that, but um, you know, it, I think it's. Um, I think we need to make decisions based on uh, what makes the most sense on our end. And while I understand your comments and concerns, um, COVID-19 is hopefully not a permanent uh, feature and that uh, some of the requirements that are in place today mm -hmm. will be mitigated over um, time. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I, so I'm a little, I'm a little less concerned. I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm a little less concerned um, about it because I believe things will change. And ultimately uh, we're gonna be taking direction from uh, the state and the county uh, and so on in terms of how we're dealing with um, public health matters. So I'll, I'll, I'll put that aside and I'll move on to my next um, question, which is um, sure. what's the uh, general service area that uh, this facility would be servicing? Uh, vehicles from here will go out, obviously American Canyon, but are they going to go to San Francisco? Are they going to go to Sacramento? Are they going to go to San Jose? Uh, or is it just going to be, you know, maybe Vacaville, Fairfield, uh, Sonoma, um, uh, Benicia, Concord? You know, uh, do, do you have, can you give I us an idea? Safe, I do not have that. I do not have our, our uh, delivery map or deli our delivery zone for this site. Um, but it is it will be primarily American Canyon and, and neighboring surrounding areas. Um, again, as we're opening up other stations uh, throughout the Bay Area, trying to fill up our uh, our network and being able to cover properly, uh, I think it's safe to say that given my somewhat knowledge of the area, uh, living I have a home in San Leandro, um, American Canyon can service probably. Again, I would just be taking a, a guess, but but those t those towns that you mentioned uh, within a 15, 20 mile radius uh, of the site might okay. It, it, it ebbs and flows, but it, yes, no, it, it you know it isn't. It wouldn't be just American Canyon. There would be neighboring surrounding communities as well. But to give you a specific hard answer of what a what our delivery zone here looks like, I, I apologize. I don't have that information. 
No, Mr. DeBruin, that, that, that's fine. I mean, you mentioned about an approximate 15, 20 mile radius, and, and that's all I'm trying to get at is, is you know, sure, uh, sure. Are, are you going to be going from here down to San Jose, which is probably, no, I don't know, no, 45, sir. 50, 60 maybe miles, uh, or are you going to be limiting it to, uh, you know, maybe Walnut Creek, which is about 20 uh, or so? Um, so that, that's, a, that's well, a, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's not in our best interest to do that. I need to open up more stations. Uh, again, I've got, I probably have another 15 requirements in the Bay Area to continue to open up more and more of these. The idea is how do I get closer to your constituents and my customers? Um, getting these products as quickly as, and effectively as possible. Um, it doesn't make much sense if I, if I, uh, need to service a delivery zone down in San Jose, how do I, it's going to take my driver, given normal Bay Area traffic, what, two hours to get down there, an hour and a half to get down there, fighting the traffic that he has to fight on any given day, and then go out and deliver his 125 to 145 packages that he might have in his truck, and then turn around and come back, he'd be out for 15 to 18 hours. And again, there is a, there is a delivery zone, and again, it ebbs and flows, given if somebody is a, we have a huge you know push let's say in in vacaville uh you know we might throw a few more vans down that way or there's a huge push in in american canyon for a, a spike in in volume uh we'll, we'll stay in american canyon just depending where our constituents order or you know uh, uh are and, and, and where the orders are being delivered to but in general it starts in american canyon it does spread out but again, it's not servicing the entire Bay Area. It's the general vicinity of American Canyon. Got it. Um, so next question I've got, and I'm not sure if this is as much for you or if this one goes to uh, Mr. Nodell, um, but you guys can fight about it, uh, which <laughs> is given that uh, we're looking at a um, building footprint now that is literally 20% of uh, the 2015 um, you know, uh, expectations. Um, I'm assuming once built, this is it. The, you know, the building is not going to, or, and really wouldn't be able to be um, increased uh, at, at, you know, this point, or, or is it possible that, uh, you know, at some point you could come back and say, hey, wait, we're finding that, you know, this approximately 200,000 square foot site, uh, building site is not enough um you know we, we need to go to 300 or 400 or or you know something uh more i'll, I'll Miss, take that um i'll take that mark um, i have fact, a good answer uh, for it as well i want to give an example of something when you're finished ernie please go ahead okay <laughs> obviously you leave all options options open uh, the building is actually designed uh that if if for some reason amazon no longer was leasing the facility and we wanted to build the million square foot building. This particular 200,000 square foot building is already constructed as the interior of it, what could be potentially a future million square foot building. So we, we've left the options open. We would obviously have to come back to uh, planning commission for design permit approval on any kind of a change. Uh, but, you know, we, we also feel that, you know, this is, this is, 21st century commerce. This is, uh, you know, Amazon is going to be in this facility for a very long time. Uh, and we hope for, you know, as long as, at least as long as I'm going to live. <laughs> um, and, uh, but th there's always the potential to make changes. Mark, you wanted to yeah, expand on Commissioner that? Or? Altman, uh, yeah, if I could expand on that a little bit. Uh, again, in, in some of the learnings that we've done over the last five years at Amazon. Well, I've gone back and forth between the sizes of buildings. I think my first building that I had selected was 42,000 square feet. Uh, we've gone back and forth and said, no, we don't want to do a bunch of small buildings throughout an area. We want to do a bigger building. Then we moved to three to four to 500,000 square foot delivery stations. But then the impacts of having a station that big uh, caused issues with jurisdictions with the the volume that was coming out of there and the traffic coming out of. Then we've gone back to smaller ones. So I'll give you a perfect example. Um, uh, 
a deal that I had started in 2018 in Milpitas, where um, we took three buildings, used two of them for parking and one of them for operation. Uh, we got so much volume out of Milpitas. I, I have uh, now in the middle of constructing another location about a thousand feet down the road on the same street. Again, it's been entitled, everything's fine, but I won't expand my footprint here if I need to, uh, at this site, if I need another building in the American Canyon area, I'll come back with hopefully uh, Ernie and others at Orchard and hopefully we can find another building in the area uh, to run as a separate facility uh, to cover our needs and, and what have you. But at this one, we are set uh, at the 200,000 plus square footer. And uh, we think that this meets our needs today. But again, it's not to say that I may not have another building 10 miles down the road that I need to service in a different direction, if you will. Okay. So to answer the question directly, we have no plans to expand this building here as far as the building footprint. Okay. And, and so that ties in with, and, and you sort of, I guess, you know, an indirect sense already answered, but I'll ask anyway. Um, you had mentioned at the beginning, you've got three levels of uh, buildings, this being sort of the smallest level, the last mile uh, warehouse. Um, we, the site's not big enough for your biggest uh, main, um, you know, distribution warehouse. Fulfillment center. Uh, fulfillment film center is what we call it. <laughs> okay. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it sounded like it could fit that mid-level, which I think you called a sortation facility. Um, yes, is there sir. a specific reason that, that, uh, you know, you're choosing, uh, this, do you have a nearby sortation facility or something like that? I believe we do have a nearby, uh, sortation okay. facility. I know we have one. In, I know we have one in Vacaville. Got it. Um, okay. So again, the idea is to find locations, it, uh, my carbon footprint is it, 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 uh, it's a sensitive topic to me and to Amazon and obviously to the world out there right now. Um, one of the things, you know, we're trying to get as close as we can uh, to, our, to our customers and to shorten delivery times and drive times to get these packages and, 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 and what have you. Um, the idea of, of, of changing this model the businesses of Amazon fulfillment, the business of Amazon sortation, uh, the Whole Foods business, the the fresh business that we have delivering groceries, things like that. I, I, I affectionately refer to them as my cousins that I see at the family reunion every 10 years. I know they exist, but they're not really a part of my life. But we're all kind of meshed together under the Amazon umbrella. AMZL, Amazon Logistics, is a separate business within Amazon. And we have our own mandates and our own budgets and things like that. So we're a little uh, internal subsidiary of, of the entire uh, product. We like for our, our, our customers to think it's streamlined. When Chairman Goff orders that, that hypothetical toaster, he doesn't need to see how the sausage is made. He just needs to know that he gets his toaster. And when it comes from that fulfillment center, to the sortation center, to me as a delivery provider, or this station being that provider, he just wants us. He want our customers want their want their uh, uh, packages on their doorstep uh, when they want them. Yes, indeed. As a prime member, I will tell you, uh, I get. <laughs> Thank I, you. I like I liked your old system where if you were late, you actually uh, extended membership for a month. Now you guys don't do that anymore. There's no penalty for being late. And unfortunately for me, a couple of times in the last uh, couple of months, you guys have been late on uh, deliveries. Well, there's been a lot of challenges in this business, that's for sure, over the last uh, time. I know I tried to order a bed frame and myself, and they told me it was going to be five weeks. So the logistics <laughs> world out of this time. Sorry about that background. Again, even for an, an Amazon employee, we have to wait. We have to wait our turn as well. So I have to apologize, but I do thank you, uh, Commissioner Altman, for being a customer. Again, more customers, the, the better job security I have. There you go. 
So that'll do it for me at this point, but thank you. I appreciate well, your question, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Wong, your turn. Any questions from you? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing any questions. I don't know if, if Commissioner Wong is on uh, mute or not. Well, we're going to give her a second. I think she's having a connection issue. She seems to be frozen on her photo. Hello? There's Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. thank you. I was having a technical difficulty. <laughs> um, so I do have a few questions. And I know with the COVID-19 era that we're in now, no one really knows when it's going away. But from what I've read and I've seen the headlines, it's made online shopping services like Amazon even busier. So I was curious if some of the numbers that you've given us, if those are current numbers, including the surge in business you've had, or if they're more average numbers without the COVID-19 impact. We have seen a surge in in, 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 our, in our orders, um, which is all the more uh, pressure for a guy like me, who's a senior program manager, in both in real estate and uh, we call our Amazon entitlements team. Um, that's the mad rush to open more delivery stations. I wish uh, uh, Ernie Nodell could do, do, could open this thing up tomorrow. I'd be ready to go then. Um, <laughs> We are, we are rushing to open up as many stations as we can to meet the demand for our customers. We think there's a, a benefit out there to help flatten the curve, uh, not only to bring jobs to a community, but also to provide, you know, that service so people can remain at home and, and what have you, and we can deliver essential products to them. So to answer your question, uh, Commissioner Wong, yes, we are seeing a, 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 an increase in, in, uh, in our orders, and we're doing our very best which hopefully gives me an excuse for Commissioner Altman of why his, why his products are being delivered a little late. Apologize. So do you help, can you maybe give us some numbers? I know you mentioned it seems like there's going to be basically two types of employees. There's the sorters and the drivers. How, do you have a rough number of how many employees of each type you would have? Well, again, we have ebbs and flows, and when I look at my traffic counts and things like that, I can sort of break that down a little bit. Again, I, you know, we're a year away from hiring, but given the size of this station and what we'd like to do here, it's a couple of hundred in the sortation associate range. Uh, in the van drivers, it's, uh, you know, maybe somewhere between 250 and 300. Uh, for managers, I figure I'll have somewhere between 25 and 30 managers running this over a 24-hour period. Uh, the delivery uh, service providers, the van drivers also have managers. I'd say there would, would be, just throwing out a number, if we had 10 different companies, uh, generally each company has two or three managers, so there's employees to, to that regard. Um, the flex drivers, well, even though they may not be employees, per se, it's again an opportunity for a stay-at-home parent, a college student, somebody just wanting to earn a little weekend money, things like that, to bring their own personal vehicle on and earn, you know, three to four, uh, you know, a set fee for delivering 25 to 40 packages for us based on their vehicle. So there's many different ways, you know, unlike a traditional business, we have just these little different pockets. You know, if I'm a, 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 an office building, I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to hire 500 people. Um, or in my employee count, but again, there's a, there are these, you know, little ebbs and flows and flexibilities. But uh, again, speaking in general terms, I would say you know a couple hundred sortation associates, uh, somewhere between 250 and 300 van drivers. Um, again, the then managers another 35 there, another 30 to 30 35 managers for the DSP companies. So. You know, all in all, it adds up, you know, to a, we think, a hopefully a, a nice number and something that we're proud of in American Can can be proud of is, again, trying to help people uh, in this new economy and, and uh, provide, provide opportunities within Amazon. 
Okay, thank you, because that's one of the things I was curious about is because, um, and this may be more question for William perhaps, one of the documents said that there was going to be significant traffic impact and it was unavoidable and that it would be for the city and Highway 29. Uh, do you know which document that is? Um, I wrote down notes MM, Trans, 1C, and 1E. So I think it was uh, a mitigation oh, yeah. point. Yeah. So that was um, from the EIR from 2015. So overall, the entire project would have a significant uh, traffic impact for, for the 173 um, acre site. And because this project is within the Napa Logistics 2, that particular mitigation measure gets transferred on to this building as well. Okay. Well, we're still, I just, you know, wanted to make a point that as part of the project though, with about 500 new employees, those are 500 people that are going to be arriving to work, you know, and, and leaving for work. Um, uh, Commissioner Wong, if I could just also point out that they are scattered again throughout a 24 hmm. hour period. So, for example, when I look at my, uh, you know, I have, you know, roughly 100 employees coming in at 1.30 in the morning uh, for sortation. Um, the van drivers come in at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, in their personal vehicles. And, again, we're, to, we're sending vans out, uh, you know, at 10 o'clock in waves. You know, the first one I believe I mentioned was 160. The second one was around 100. 28. Um, again, ebbs and flows a little bit, but again, we're just, we, we're, we're not going to flood the roadway systems throughout American Canyon in, in all big one lump sum. It's all scattered out. When I talk about the line haul trucks coming in, you know, the majority of them, you know, are coming in between 10 and 4 a.m., 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. with a few scattered throughout the day and things like that. So again, the overall harshness of that kind of number isn't all affected in, in a, you know, not everybody's coming in at eight o'clock in the morning to report for work. It, it's, it's throughout the 24 hour cycle that I described earlier. And I, I appreciate I that and how it was, it was noted in the documentation that a lot of this is during off peak hours. Um, yes, ma'am, it certainly is. But with about 500 employees, um, maybe William, you might know the answer would, Amazon be one of the larger employees in the city or are there, cause I know a lot of what's in the industrial park is warehousing, which typically doesn't have as many employees. Mm. Yes. I think they would be in the top 10 for us uh, if it was a 500 employees. Um, I don't know the exact, uh, they're, they're usually in, in our uh, CAFR. A comprehensive mm -hmm. financial report at the end they show the top 10 employees and um I th with a number like 500 it will definitely bump into the top 10 but i don't know where it would rank within yeah. that i'll just look at the CAFR right Wait. now and see okay commissioner wong if i could also just clarify something the amazon delivery drivers are not technically considered amazon employees they are a third party company. We hire these, these various companies. Again, they drive for us exclusively and they're there. I mean, the driver, the DSP companies wouldn't be there if our facility was not there. So it's an indirect, mm -hmm. but again, we have standards, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, safety measures, uh, background checks, things like that. A, a, a strong criteria, uh, back, you know, driver, driving record, uh, driver checks, uh, DMV checks, things like that. So again, while they may not be Amazon technical employees with a paycheck every two weeks from Amazon, they are paid through their delivery service providers that we hire and contract out. Okay. Um, I had a, I, I had looked at the project plans and there was some reference to customer pickup, um, customer kiosks, pick up lockers. Can you speak more to that in the plans? Will there be customer access at this facility or is it typically only for your behind the scenes work? Yes, ma'am. One of the new things, and again, it's just sort of a belt and suspender that we like to offer our customers. Um, 
Councilor Commissioner Wong, uh, if you're an Amazon customer, let's say you order an expensive item uh, from Amazon, uh, uh, I'll use an example, let's say a $1,000 camera, um, you may not want that product placed on your doorstep or delivered, or you may be gone for a day or two when Amazon said they'll deliver that. We'd like to give our customers the option to be able to drive to the facility. We have uh, on, our, on our site plan maybe seven or eight designated spaces. It's just an option that we offer that you can come in, have the app on your phone. We'll notify you when that product came, came in, and you can come to the station and pick it up. Or if you live 25 miles away and you're on your way to the airport and you leave work and you've got that last minute uh, package that you want to take with you on a trip, um, you know, you might not want to go back home and look for that package. You may want the option to have it delivered to the Amazon facility there on your way to a weekend trip via your car or you're going to the airport or things like that. We just offer it as, a, as an ancillary uh, uh, product, if you will, to our customers. If they'd like to come pick up a, a, any individual product at the station, they can. We think it's a de minimis use. Um, we've, we've had it now going on for about seven or eight months. And again, we're seeing the, in a lot of our other stations, a very, very limited number of people coming to do that. The idea is people like to get their packages delivered to their doorstep. It's almost Christmas every day for them. Um, anyway, we just, we just offer it as an option. Okay. I, I was just curious because I was just wondering if we do pick it up in American Canyon, does that mean we get any sales tax off of it? Uh, is there any additional revenue basis, you know, for the city? I can't speak to that. I think that the tax base is the question I hear every once in a while. But I believe the tax base is based out of the state with the state of uh, California, Sacramento, and how they disseminate that down. Uh, I don't know how that works, but um, I, I, don't, I don't, at least I think in our world, it doesn't affect whether it's picked up or delivered to your house. Okay, thank you. Um, and you, I think either you or maybe it was another gentleman, someone mentioned Amazon Fresh. So the, will that be part of the service offered through this local station? No, ma'am. Amazon Fresh is a separate business. I just talked about my different business partners, meaning the fulfillment center business or the uh, mm -hmm. sortation business or the, the fresh business. Like I said, okay. I call them my cousins that I see, but no, it's not, it's not part of this station at all. That requires a refrigeration unit and things like that. There'll be none of that here. Okay. Um, and then this is getting down into the weeds of it all. I enjoyed seeing the detail that you put into the shrubbery and whatnot that you were offering. I enjoyed seeing the native plants mentioned. And I wanted to put a plea out there. I hope you're – consider including some California native milkweeds. We need more plants for our monarch butterflies. We'll, we'll certainly look into that. I know that our last design permit approval, uh, we were asked not to plant oleander and we're not planting oleander. So That was me. <laughs> we will we'll, we'll certainly look into that. I'm sorry, we lost your sound again. I'm sorry, we don't hear Commissioner Wong. We're going to give her an opportunity to see if we can reconnect. I'll just jump in. I just have um, really just a couple of questions. Most everybody has addressed it. One of the items was around security that was brought up, and it was mentioned that there's not really much stuff that is housed permanently in this station. Uh, it's brought in and then yep. cycled out as possible. My concern around the security is more around the van storage. Um, I believe those the vans or sprinter vans are going to be kept on site and then employees yes, will sir. come in with those vans. Is there security measures around considering the vans, um, some type of permit or fencing or something like that to secure those? 
Uh, I, I defer to Mr. Nodell on that one, Ernie. I don't know if we're putting uh, – is that called for in the plans? I, I apologize. I'm not up to speed on that. No, there, there is no security fencing being provided for this particular facility. Um, because the way it runs, there's so many different points of access into the facility, it would be extremely difficult to control all that. There are six different points of access. We certainly yeah. have, we'll have uh, monitoring cameras uh, out there in the facility as well, certainly around the building and what have you. So um, yeah, you can't access it. the building without a, without a badge. Uh, it's controlled access into the building. Uh, but as far as the vans are locked up at night, parked in sections, it'll be lit. Um, and again, I don't know if we'll have cameras out in the parking lot, but I know we certainly have them around the building. I'm just considering the, um, you know, the possible additional responsibilities for American Canyon PD, if that can be mitigated in some way, shape or form, either through, as you mentioned, security cameras or fencing or something like that. Commissioner Wong, did you make it back on? I don't see her. Thank you. I was having technical difficulties again. Did you have an additional I am question? hung up of muting myself. Do you have any additional questions, Commissioner Wong? No, I didn't. That was everything. Thank you. Good. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. So at this point in time, we're going to go ahead and move into public comment on this matter. Um, let me read my little item here. Oh, he's so good. Yeah, I'm so good. I've been told. Um, <laughs> moving on to item 2.2, which is consider a resolution to approve the design permit for a new 201,950 201, square foot warehouse distribution e-commerce building with accessory office space on a 58.02 acre portion of the 173 acre Napa Logistics Park Phase 2 project site located on Napa Airport Industrial Area Specific Plan. Um, as a reminder, if you wish to make a public comment on this, you can please email njones at cityofamericancanyon.org um, and she will call you or read your statement or you can call directly 707-647-4348 and you can announce your comment over the phone. Um, Ms. Jones, do we have any comments at this point in time? We do not at this time, Chairman Goff. I do not have anything for this matter. Um, we're going to go ahead and close pu public comment. And we're going to move on to any further commission comments. And again, I'm just going to reverse order it. So we're going to start with Ms. Wong. Do you have Commissioner Wong? Do you have anything? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Altman. I've got one other that just occurred to me as I'm looking at the uh, building um, design plans and uh, seeing the two uh, overhangs, um, which anytime I see that makes me kind of think solar. Waiting for you to get uh, there. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's my question is there, uh, whether it be on the overhangs or whether it be in terms of um, shading uh, parking spaces for uh, whether it be the sprinter vans or the um, employee parking or so on to, uh, you know, do the uh, solar carport or, or whatnot type approach as a um, green uh, means of uh, supplying energy. Uh, it's probably not going to be enough to uh, cover the uh, operation of the facility, but, uh, you know, it probably wouldn't hurt. Commissioner Altman, I'll take this one because I always answer it for you. Um, as and in I all always of our ask buildings, you. Yes, you do. Um, in all of the buildings that we design, the uh, roof structure of the building is designed to support solar. Uh, the canopies in this particular uh, case are not in the appropriate directions, nor because of the clear span of the canopies, their sole purpose is to protect the products being taken out to the vans uh, from any rain or you know inclement weather, 
uh, and they really wouldn't su be able to support, uh, there's no way to su support solar panels, but also because of the positioning, their east-west directions uh, are not appropriate. Uh, installation of solar always up to the tenant. Um, you know, they, they take all, all sorts of things into consideration, um, but there's no, uh, we, we have it all pre-structured for solar. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Anything else, Commissioner Ullman? I am good for now. Okay, Commissioner Malari, anything from you? Good, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Navarro? No, I think uh, it's a great presentation, so I'm, I'm okay. Thank you. Um, and for Thank myself, you. yeah, great, great information. Thank you very much. I really appreciate for um, Orchard Partners um, all the effort that has gone into this entire site and the support of a lot of the infrastructure things for our city. Um, you mentioned the um, pressure waste line. You mentioned the recycled water. You mentioned the road improvements that are going on. The turnabout, all of those items, you know, are just nothing but, but going to be hugely beneficial to our city itself. So I want to make sure I thank Orchard Partners explicitly for that contribution and willingness to take that on into your uh, projects as you build them out. I also want to thank Mr. Uh, De Bruin for his excellent, De Bruin, sorry, excellent uh, overview of the <laughs> business model and distribution of Amazon products. I am still waiting on my toaster. Uh, so I'm going to put some in there. Uh, you have my cell phone number, sir. If it doesn't come tomorrow, you give me a call and complain, and I'll see what I can do for you. Uh, but I want to thank you both for your presentations. No, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's all I have on this point. Is there any actions from the commission? I'll make a motion to um, approve the resolution of the Planning Commission for a City of American Canyon, California. Uh, a design permit for development of a 201,950 square foot warehouse distribution commerce building with accessory office space on a 58.2 acre parcel in the Napa Logistics Park Phase 2, APN 057-360007. I would like to uh, modify this um, resolution and include a um, condition to be worked out by the uh, city planning department and others um, for a uh, local hiring um, best effort. Do we need better wording on that condition? Um, Prior to issuance of um, Building permits, the applicant shall present a plan to hire local employees to the best of their ability. That works for me. Thank you. That work for the applicant? I wish I was a better expert uh, on that uh, on that topic. Um, I, I again, I'll, I'll make a comment. You know, we use our best efforts to yes to hire uh, to hire locally. Given given whatever the world we live in, you know, hopefully nine months from now it's better. Um, it is in our it is our interest to do that to hire. So um, best efforts is is, uh, is 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 acceptable. Okay. All right. So we have an motion with an addendum. I will then second the amended motion. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Altman? Aye. Commissioner Mallory? Aye. Commissioner Wong? Aye. Vice Chairman Navarro? Aye. Chairman Dahl? Aye. All right, thank you everybody on item 2.2. I appreciate your- Thank you. Knowledge and sharing out if you- like to take this time to exit before we transition. Thank you very much.
Commissioners, thank you all so much. Look forward to becoming a uh, corporate member of uh, American Canyon. Thank you so much. Thank you. We look forward to thank having you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Goff, I need to step away for a few minutes. We uh, go into a quick 10 minute rest or recess and then we can return. Okay, thank you. That sounds great. We'll come back okay. at, uh, let's just call it nine, well, let's just call it 9 30. That will give us 14 minutes. Okay, thank you. Nicole, did we get anybody from a uh, public comment from the first two items? No, we didn't. Okay. Thank so you. Nothing's coming. I will let you know if we get public comment at, um, for items if they're delayed. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, do we have everybody back? We can resume. Looks like Commissioner Navarro, you back? It might have. Commissioner Navarro? Vice Chair Navarro. Assistant Vice Chair. All right, so we're going to come back in order. We're going to move on. We are now at item 2.3. Consider a resolution to recommend the City Council comply with the judicially supervised agreement mm -hmm. and relief made and entered into under Code of Civil Procedure Section 664.6 with respect to litigation entitled California Clean Energy Committee versus the City of American Canyon, Napa County Superior Court Case Number 19CV001013 with the following actions. A, approve an amendment to the Broadway specific, District Specific Plan Final Environmental Impact Report and amend the BSD SP for American Canyon Municipal Code Chapter 10.5 two trip reduction requirements. And we have a staff presentation. Yes, thank you, Chair Goff and Planning Commissioners. Um, happy to present this to you. It's it's not as bad as the title sounds. So I just want to <laughs> kind of reassure you. I'm happy to also have um, uh, our city attorney is here. We can breeze these sort of things given it's a legal court settlement. And also you can't see him, but we have our public works director, Rick Kaufman present um, in case there's questions that come up of that nature. But um, I have a presentation where I can kind of walk you through what it's all about and um, we can field questions after that. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen and see if we can get this right. Okay, here we are. Um, just wanted to, to tell you that um, it was almost a year ago today that the Planning Commission reviewed the Broadway District Plan and recommended its approval to the City Council. That's how it works. Um, just as a kind of a reminder, because it has been a year, um, the Broadway Plan is, is one to transform an auto-oriented highway area with strip commercial into a vibrant place for people to live and work and enjoy themselves. Um, it also helps promote develop economic development with defining new development that's uh, based on market realities and uh, streamlining the environmental. Um, all those things uh, mercifully are still in the plan and, and haven't been changed with this uh, settlement agreement. Um, just so visually, um, the uh, district, which is kind of linear and in a way it's uh, zoned, uh, was chopped up into eight districts to kind of provide some identity and order in, um, for this area and provide um, marketable uses in, in well-defined areas that are compatible. Um, another centerpiece of this plan was looking at the highway and uh, suggesting that the speed limit be reduced from 50 and 55 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour to really help with that placemaking. Uh, and, and so that, that still is, is part of the plan and, and there's no, no change to that. Just I mentioned it was about a year ago that the Planning Commission reviewed this and I have a, a, sort of a brief summary here of some of the milestones since that time. The City Council uh, in their next meeting also in June reviewed the plan and approved it and then had their second reading in July. Um, they also certified the program environmental impact report and that was the document that the California Clean Energy Coalition um, challenged in their writ of mandamus um, a few days later on July 8th. So over that period of time between July and January, our city attorney was very busy working um, with the Clean Air Coalition and in January arrived at a settlement agreement 
um, which puts forward a variety of amendments to the plan. Um, the, I'll say kicker at the time is that many of those changes were dependent upon a plan that was ongoing um, led by the Napa Valley Transportation Authority that the city was a partnership with for congestion management plan for Highway 29. And so a lot of the features that were agreed upon are really things that are meant to have our left hand and right hand agree to each other to, to provide some um, consistency among these documents. So in May 2020, just actually on the 20th of 2020, um, the MBTA board approved the quarter plan and then that kind of set off timeframes of, of amending the plan now that we have one that's in place. Um, and here we are tonight with the red arrow on the 25th. Um, assuming we have a decision from the Planning Commission, um, this was tentatively scheduled to be reviewed by the City Council on July 21st for first reading and then second reading in August. So I'm gonna show you did an excellent job reading, so I won't read it again. That's the name of the, uh, the um, agreement that uh, kicked off this um, settlement. So I have a list here um, on this screen and the next one of the specific changes that this uh, agreement um, calls for. And I've highlighted in green some of the uh, policies that are adopted already in the Highway 29 Congestion Management Plan that this agreement calls for incorporating into the Broadway plan. So all of these things that are in green, well, those are existing policies and they're in another plan. And so, like I mentioned, the objective here is to have co consistency and coherence among our plans. Um, I believe that was really the motivation of the California Clean Energy Coalition. And so I just highlighted them in green here and, and I'll go kind of briefly through them one by one. Um, but the first one here, uh, you know, endeavoring to get through this plan. Um, the city's in partnership with NVTA on this congestion management plan. Um, and so uh, that part has been, has been addressed. Um, but actually, let me go to the second screen here. And, and I know, Summer, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Um, we have two more here in green um, that are referring to some, some policies. The other, the other ones are also related um, in some cases, adopted policies, but I'll get to that. But they're just not part of the congestion management plan for the highway. So I'm going to briefly run through how we've complied with each of these requirements in the agreement. So we want to be sure that you know, the effort here that we've accomplished, what the courts have spelled out and, and have authorized. Um, and so the first one here is um, uh, city support of the congestion management plan and that in fact was approved in 2020 so that's ticked off the list right there. The second one is referring to amending the Broadway plan um, consistent with some of those congestion management plan and policies along with an CEQA Environmental Quality Act review. So just addressing that one for the moment uh, we prepared an addendum under the auspices of the California Environmental Quality Act, and that's attached to the report. Um, and I have some explanation further on of how we complied with that. Um, and then the agreement itself, I've, I kind of followed the numbering sequence that's in there, so it's easy to follow. Um, this is area 2A, um, referring to incorporating a bus on shoulder program. Um, and so that's from the uh, Highway 29 congestion management plan. And, and so it's kind of pulled out from that plan and also uh, placed into the circulation element portion. A um, couple of different agencies here that would be responsible for implementing it. Um, obviously the bus itself is, is operated by the Napa Valley Transportation Authority. And Caltrans that owns the highway, um, it provides uh, authority to allow buses to use the shoulder and uh, they have guidance. And so this is really incorporating other agencies' policies into our plan. But um, it is those other agencies that would implement it. 
Um, along the same token with this next one, um, 2B, um, this is a transit priority pilot program. And so this is where the buses have transponders and they're able to, much like ambulances can, trigger a green light so that they can move along through more quickly. And that's uh, a way of being able to make it um, advantageous to use the buses versus an automobile. And so um, this is something that uh, is meant to give them an advantage to be competitive with a single car. 2C um, is referring to new transit stops. One of the benefits that existed in the plan that was adopted with improvements to Highway 29, as it was called out, it gives the opportunity to provide transit stops on the highway itself. Right now, we don't have safe places for transit stops, and so they've got to wind their way through town. It slows things down. Um, and so this agreement here is referring to some specific um, locations that are in the, the congestion management plan. Um, the only difference between what was talked about in the agreement had to do with uh, a bus stop at American Canyon Road. And at the end of the day, um, the congestion management plan placed it at Crawford Way, so close by, I think because American Canyon Road is such a busy road, probably not a great place to put a bus. So, um, but, but everything else has been pulled forward just as the plan has agreed. I think that's one of the reasons why um, the settlement agreement said, wait for the plan to be adopted because you want to have the final plan and not enter inconsistencies when the goal is to have consistency. Um, item 2D um, refers to connecting our bike plans with our, our transit stops. And so those are discussed in the congestion management plan. Um, I have a graphic here from the congestion management plan that we pulled into the Broadway plan and it makes mention of the Vine Trail, the San Francisco Bay Trail, River to Ridge Trail, um, and our Highway 29 bike lanes. Many of those were already in the, the Broadway plan, but this kind of helps bring it together um, so that you can take your bike to the transit, put the bike on the bus, and then head where you're going to go. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. 2E is not from the congestion management plan, but this is a separate issue to help foster um, greater awareness and inclusion of transit-oriented housing in our plan. And so um, this is one where uh, new residential developments um, are required to have um, uh, features in there that help promote transit. Um, I've listed uh, 100 units or more, but there's also a lesser prorated plan for housing developments of less than that. But the idea here is um, you get uh, encouraging development that's near and proximate to transit, shopping, um, you get bonuses if the housing itself is affordable, more so than our inclusionary ordinance. Um, and then also frontage improvements to help implement those bike trails and things. So um, that is incorporated in there. Um, I've used as a template uh, a program in Sunnyvale, which is a very progressive community. Um, it seemed to have all of the same components that is called for in this agreement. I kind of extracted that and applied it um, where, uh, with, with, with our local um, agencies that would, would hook into this. Um, areas 2F is sort of a generic um, transit enhancement and congestion reducing features. Um, the emphasis being here on, on transit traffic demand management. Um, one of the main ones um, that's uh, significant, uh, probably from many people's minds, is um, the Broadway plan called for it, adding one additional travel lane each direction. Um, the congestion management plan um, is strongly uh, uh, feeling that there's, there isn't funding for additional capacity enhancement. Um, and so the idea is to get more capacity through vehicle um, and transit use and efficiencies and congestion. Um, and so um, this plan would, would, would remove the six lane configuration um, and then add in the four lanes. Um, it has been talked about um, in the context of the city council discussing the congestion management plan. And the idea is, well, perhaps not completely abandoning the option 
um, having, you know, it's a very wide right of way, um, having some of the pedestrian improvements at the perimeter of the right of way, and then they perhaps a very wide median so that if, if in some case, in some manner, in future, um, that extra lane could be in if it felt needed. Um, it hasn't been foreclosed. But uh, at this point, the idea here to be compatible and consistent with the agreement, it would change the um, plan into a four lane configuration, which is consistent with the um, congestion management plan, which given that it's from our congestion management agency and they're the funding gatekeeper, um, kind of a reality. Um, I've mentioned that, you know, all of the things that were in the original Broadway plan have not been abandoned. These things are were part of the original plan. They are still part of the plan. Um, everyone is looking forward to livable features. Um, and so these are, are still uh, part of the plan. Um, and so we're, we're keeping that. Uh, moving on to agreement 2F. Um, once again, these are other, other things for consistency with other congestion management. Um, these would be things like a transit queue jump. So if the bus stopped at a red light, it gets to go green in front of the cars that are waiting in line, queue jump. Um, integrated corridor management, that's kind of high tech. Um, there would be a transit management center with being able to real time, uh, change some of the timing on the signals. Um, there would be detectors. Um, I know that uh, we received a comment regarding trailblazer signs um, with respect to parallel routes. Um, I think there is further discussion needed on what we mean by parallel routes. Um, I know that, that Newell is intended to be a parallel route and Devlin is intended to be a parallel route. And we're concerned about traffic calming in residential neighborhoods. Um, so uh, these are things I'm sure we can clarify, but uh, the primary parallel routes Devlin and Newell. Um, but other high tech ideas are cameras and message signs and, and just ways of being able to, to manage the capacity in a more intelligent manner, giving people information so that they can make some choices to avoid congestion. But uh, I definitely understand a concern about um, unintentionally diverting cars onto our parallel residential roads be definitely I don't think that's that is intended in this in this goal but I'm sure we can talk about it further um, agreement number three um, at this time back in January um, NVTA was in the process of developing their new bicycle master plan which uh, the Planning Commission reviewed uh, probably in January but it went because it went to the City Council in February um, and so that's been accomplished and we can check that off the list um, so we're all happy about that um, agreement number four, um, and this is modernizing uh, an ordinance the city had that dates all the way back to 1992, <laughs> 94, anyway, long time ago. Um, and the world has changed, particularly in the Bay Area. Um, there's been state laws changed. There's been an entirely new program that's administered by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And it applies universally around the Bay Area, including American Canyon. And so the standard for that program is all employers of 50 or more employees um, is required by law in the Bay Area to work with the Bay Area Quality Plan on a trip reduction plan. And so the amendment to the ordinance uh, accomplishes what the agreement says, but it updates it um, to reflect what's actually happening today which is a, a much better way, in my opinion, to address this of the regional effort and the resources um, to be able to get a good program instead of city by city by city. So we have an ordinance in our packet that uh, updates that um, into today's way of doing things. And then I think this is the last one. So when you're here, um, and this is just, um, long-term commitment to the MBT and Caltrans to implement the um, measures in the Highway 29 congestion management plan. And American Canyon has contributed $250,000 to this plan, along with um, ensuring 
that it creates a project implementation document which is needed in order to access federal funds to help pay for the implementation. Um, and, and, and I guess, while not specifically in the agreement, um, we've made some other amendments to the other chapters in the Broadway plan, just so that throughout it, it's, there is no inconsistency. And so we went through and made sure that anything that needs cross-referencing and updating, we took care of that. The, I mentioned the addendum, um, and this is, uh, it was, well, the item, previous item was an addendum to the Napa Logistics Park EIR. This is an addendum to the probably specific plan program EIR. Uh, addendums are, is a way that when you're modifying a project, if there is no new environmental impacts, um, you're not changing anything that substantially increases in environmental impact. Um, and so, um, we provided that documentation in the addendum. Um, and so that's part of your recommendation that we have for you um, to, to move that part forward and fulfill our, com our commitment to addressing um, the California Environmental Quality Act aspect of this change. And I wanted to just print here, um, just a little more than an hour before the meeting start, I got an email from the uh, representative of the California Energy Coalition, Clean Energy Coalition, and um, he endorses the recommendations and agrees that they fulfill the obligations under the um, agreement, which was a big concern of mine. You don't want to go through all this effort and then find that disagreement. So that was very, very thoughtful of Mr. Wilson to provide that. So I thought I would just share that with you um, so that uh, you can be comfortable in knowing that what we have here is what was intended with this agreement. And with that, um, staff recommendation is very much like the uh, title, so I won't repeat it, but other than to summarize it, um, to recommend approval of the city council, approve the addendum to the program EIR and uh, amend the Broadway plan. And separate from that is our chapter 10.5. 52 trip reduction requirements. So um, I'll stop sharing the screen and I'm glad to answer your questions. All right. Okay, we're going to go on to uh, commission questions. Uh, we're going to start with Commissioner Altman. Wow, starting with me and surprise, surprise. You may want to do it more often because I actually don't really have any questions on this one at this point. Um, I guess the only, uh, my only uh, broad comment would be, does our uh, city attorney have any comments regarding this that he would like to uh, make? And aside from that, I'll, I'll listen. I, th I think uh, Brent did a very good job of showing how an already public uh, corridor plan that's received all kinds of public input, uh, certainly not to the level of the Broadway district uh, specific plan, overlays on what we got in the underlying Broadway district specific plan and coordinates with the required elements of the settlement. Um, the, you know, I've had a conversation with Eugene too. He does want these adopted. Is it technically something you have to do tonight? Uh, the answer is no. And in fact, um, this is a specific plan amendment. And in terms of facilitating principles in the general plan guidelines of ensuring full participation, uh, there is some benefit to making sure uh, that these proposed changes are made known to uh, the public. Now, obviously, there was Brown Act compliance notice with this council meeting, or this commission meeting, excuse me. But um, if this were amendments to the specific plan that the city was initiated, you in all, in all likelihood uh, have 
um, uh, uh, probably two hearings on this or one hearing preceded by mm -hmm. workshop to ensure that you got public input. So that would be the comment that I think the commission could, should consider because this is an amendment to the specific plan. I, I can't recall, Brent, but I think there has been one comment that's come in within yes. the 72-hour period. So uh, on the one hand, it's a tremendous amount of paper, but I think um, there's one way to look at it is that it's an overlay on something that you're familiar with already, that that overlay has received uh, public examination and input uh, before NVTA. Granted, someone in American Canyon probably doesn't sit at home at night thinking about appearing before the NVTA, which is the very reason that I think it is probably appropriate to consider continuing this to the next meeting of your commission to ensure that there is adequate time for a public review. So that would be my comment. Thank you. That does it for me. For now. Mr. Munalari. Um, no, no comment for right now, um, but it was a lot of hefty information to kind of absorb mm -hmm. um, within this time frame. So I will admit I have not taken a look at every single thing on here, but I do um, would I would like to kind of recommend if we table it or we open it up to whatever com comments that we have now and then you know possibly either get on another meeting to discuss it further so we can have more ample time to review all the documents um that's just my take on it okay thank you commissioner navarro um <clears throat> well are we i was wondering are we going to read in the public comment uh that was put in okay um no, I, I do wonder what the supervision really entails and does it involve the planning commission at all? And uh, other than that, that's a pretty quick settlement from October to January. So uh, good job city attorney or whoever mm -hmm. <laughs> in getting that turned around so quick. Uh, let's be realistic. There were attorney's fees involved for the other side. I think that may have been a motivating factor. Uh -huh. Uh, Commissioner Warren, do you have anything? I'm being very careful with my mute button. <laughs> um, so I guess I have a question and then also a comment. My question is I would like to get more transparency about what trailblazer signs are and how do they work because from reading the document, it says they alleviate congestion on SR29 by diverting some drivers to parallel routes. And those parallel routes are residential neighborhoods. And that's something as living on Wetlands Edge Road that we've, mm. you know, we experience a lot of. And so I'm, you know, I would like to hear more about that. Maybe just a better explanation of how it's going to be implemented, what it, mm. what it would look like. And I would support having an opportunity for more information about the trailblazer signs we made public to get more residents on some of these neighborhoods like Donaldson, Rio Del Mar, you know, they already have a lot of traffic. And I, I would think that there should be notification that would go out to the residents impacted where we're going to direct 29 traffic to, hey, this could be happening. This is your opportunity. Please come and be informed and participate in this discussion. So the, the, those would be my um, comments and questions. Thank you. Um, you guys have covered everything that I made note of, so I don't have any additional at this point in time. Um, so we're gonna move on to public comment. So we're gonna open public comment on this. I have received one item. Um, I'd like to read it out for everybody. Um, so this is an email sent by Christopher James, and it reads as such. Regarding the amendment to the previous approved Broadway district specific plan, the circulation element references trailblazer signs. The document says that they are designed to alleviate congestion 
and SR29 by diverting some drivers to parallel routes. Promoting cut through traffic onto already busy residential roads at the expense of neighborhood quality of life is a poor solution. Please strike this amendment from the circulation plan. This change is a huge impact to local residents and merits a workshop to solicit residential and community input. As a member of the Wetlands Edge Traffic Calming Committee, adding more traffic to local streets is the opposite of what most residents want. It is disappointing that a significant change like this was buried in an appendix and not called out in the staff summary on the changes. Um, regards, Christopher James. <laughs> Nicole, do we have anything else? We do have not received any additional public comment. Okay, thank you on that. Um, so at this point in time, I'm going to move to close public comment. And then we're going on to commissioner comments. Okay, I and I'm going to reverse order. So we're going to start with Commissioner Wong. Any comments besides? No, I, I don't have any um, additional comments. Just maybe if at some point Brent could maybe speak mm -hmm. more about that. Signs. Thank That's you. great. We can definitely drill down on that and get some clarification on it. Commissioner Navarro? Uh, no, I'm okay. Um, just, uh, you know, what I'm just going to assume that there is no, this, this ruling has no impact on anything that we do or, or have done um, in terms of the Broadway um, district plan. Wow. Um, I'm pretty sure that we're live and working on two Okay, thanks. Bye. And where do I go? Malari? No more comments at this moment, thank you. Mr. Altman. All out, my only comment will be, uh, I think it would be a wise idea if we uh, listened to our city attorney and uh, considered a continuance um, so that we can uh, get more public input and uh, potentially as uh, Mr. James uh, suggested, um, have, uh, what was his terminology? Uh, They said uh, uh, meriting a workshop uh, so that we might consider uh, some sort of workshop um, in the interim to uh, try and generate. Uh, it's tougher with COVID-19 um, and social distancing, uh, you know, guidelines. But if there's a way to um, generate additional public comment, uh, I, I think we should definitely uh, look at that. So I guess my follow-up on that for uh, Mr. Cooper is, was there any type of messaging sent out to our community re regarding this item besides what the uh, Ethel Valley Transit right. Authority mm -hmm. did? Okay, good, thanks. It was, it, I mean, we use the usual, um, we have a publication, um, it's in the around town, it's in part of the city manager's update, you know, we have our normal outreach, so. Folks are subscribed and and read. Well, then they would they would, they would find out. But there wasn't any type of other neighborhood notification, such as possible some of those through streets, Newell or Wetlands or Rio Del Mar or whatever. May no. Um, no, we didn't do any specific notification. I think. I think on the issue of the trailblazing signs before we get people worried, I think it needs to be clarified. I don't want to get people, you know, upset if, if that isn't what was intended and no one thought that was what it meant. And so I, I wouldn't want to go out there and tell people that we're putting up signs to divert traffic if that was never the intent in the first place. Um, and if that was the intent, well, then maybe we need to talk about that because, um, you know, we're interested in, in traffic calming. Um, the circulation element that we have is one that has a principle to, to divert traffic away from residential areas through traffic away from residential areas and not bring it to it. So uh, I don't think there was ever an intent to go backwards and, and adopt a policy that would then unintentionally 
um, take, you know, move us in a direction no one wants. So at this point in time, are there any commission actions regarding this item? I'll move for a uh, continuance of this uh, item to a future meeting date to be determined after uh, some sort of um, additional uh, public outreach for uh, comment, as well as research by staff in terms of, um, you know, uh, what the party's intent here is, was. Is that in regard to specifically the trailblazer signage? Yes. Yeah. All second. Have a motion and a second. Nicole, are you there? We uh, just um, we just go get her. Okay. okay. <laughs> So, is this a record for lengthy commissioner sorry. planning commission meetings? I'm I'm sorry. I was dealing with the technical issue. You guys, I'm back. So, um, we need a vote. Yeah, Eric, can you restate your you rest commissioner? Please? Can you restate your motion, please? Sure. I will uh, move for continuance of this um, discussion on this resolution on this uh, agenda item. Uh, in, to a later date uh, after the uh, city staff has done some additional research and uh, efforts have been made for additional um, public comment, uh, specifically regarding the trailblazer signs issue um, with the uh, city staff selecting a uh, appropriate date to uh, re-agendize this item. And who seconded? I believe that was Commissioner Wong. Commissioner Wong. Um, I will second it, but Eric, did you, maybe I missed it, but you, in the original one, you had worded it to include a workshop as well? Well, to, to public comment, whether, whether that be in the form of a workshop or whatever, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the city staff work on developing mm -hmm. what makes the most sense, especially with COVID-19. I don't know if we can really do the kind of public workshop that we've done for other things in the past. So I, I won't specifically say a workshop, but a, to generate additional public comment. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll second that motion. Great. Um, and once again, my apologies. Uh, Commissioner Altman? Yes. Commissioner Malari? Yes. Commissioner Wong? Yes. Vice Chairman Navarro? Yes. Chairman Goff. Yes. All right, that's the end of 2.3. Before we move on to 2.4, I wanna check on how everybody's doing. As mentioned, we are at a little bit after 10 o'clock. We have one more item on the agenda. Okay. Everybody good to go? Sure. I don't see anybody falling over in their chairs or disappearing. <laughs> I might soon. You might, might soon. need to stand up. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to move on to item 2.4. Consider a resolution recommending the City Council approve a development agreement for the Napa Airport Corporate Center project approvals to extend the time period for acting on these approvals for five years after the development approval effective date. This is PL 20-0019. Our city attorney will have a presentation on this. Um, the uh, staff report on this matter is pretty straightforward. Um, a year ago, there were a series of discretionary permits that were extended for one year that together comprised what had been the previously approved Napa Airport Corporate Center. That was subject to a full environmental review and as the staff report indicates, the project's been cut down in size. I, I don't want to make a direct analogy to Napa logistics, but there have been a variety of things that have reduced the original footprint to what's proposed now. Um, 
they are a component, meaning Napa Airport Corporate Center, of the improvement plans for both the extension of Devlin Road and its interaction with South Kelly Road, the uh, critical parallel corridor that's now been referred to two times tonight, uh, once in 2.3 and also in 2.2. Um, the issue associated with the individual permits was uh, based on the authority that you would have and the city has under each of those individual permits, we could not require the total amount of dedication and right of way that would be needed to uh, fully secure uh, the necessary right of ways for the fully improved South Napa Junction Devlin Road improvements. Uh, the developer was approached on this issue and um, in order, you know, and they're agreeable, uh, in order to freeze the development standards that are applicable right now and extend those for five years. Um, I don't know where I went. Oh, there I am. Um, they uh, and worked with city staff to get the proposed development agreement. Uh, stated another way, the consideration for this agreement is the city gets the benefit of the right of ways necessary to complete the parallel route to 29 on the west side from Devlin and the connections with South Kelly Road. Um, the prior environmental analysis would be adequate for this. There's also an addendum and the proposed addendum would be used, associates considerations of associated with COVID-19. Uh, and I think there's a, a finite issue here uh, that you know, may have, you know, is dealt with in, more, in a more comprehensive manner than on item 2.2, is there's no question that COVID-19 has had an impact uh, on the environment. The question is under the state regulatory um, scheme, CEQA, uh, it doesn't, and concern the concept of the human environment. Uh, whereas under the National Environmental Policy Act, it does. However, because of the impacts on the economy, which is on the physical environment, uh, there is an impact to be assessed and that's integrated into the analysis of the proposed development agreement uh, that would facilitate uh, the quick resolution of basically plugging in the improvements needed for Napa Airport Corporate Center with those associated with Napa Logistics. So that's set forth in the proposed development agreement. Your requirement under both our ordinance and state law is to make a recommendation to the City Council on this matter. Uh, I've discussed with most of you, there are time constraints and Brent's emphasized those in the staff report is the underlying permits expire on July 31st. So in order to meet uh, the council's uh, projected uh, consideration of this matter, it would be necessary to get a recommendation of the commission tonight. You could recommend denial. You could recommend modifications to uh, what's in the proposed agreement also. So that would be the summary of what's before you uh, with the environmental analysis, understanding that what's been done before is adequate. Again, we would utilize an addendum um, for the reasons stated. So if there are any questions, uh, I'd attempt to offer uh, to answer them, along with Brent, of course. Thank um, you. I just have one just quick question relating, relating to the extension. It's uh, extend the time period for acting on these approvals for five years after the development approval effective date. So right. that, I guess, the question on that time frame: when does that five-year clock start? What was the is that approval date? That, that, that yeah. you want to go, Brent, or I can go. Brent, unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm frozen. Sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't do that. Um, the effective date, the uh, five years begins on 30 days following the second reading by the city council. So we normally pop in the, you know, the actual date, but we don't, can't control, you know, schedule for the city council. 
precisely. So it's kind of left a little open ended, but it's it's um, after it's effective, okay. following approval by the city council. I think the way that we're going to do that is um, under the subdivision map act. Uh, there's a provision in the subdivision map act which um, our ordinance parallels is that if there's an indication of offsite approvals of a specific amount, dollar amount, which is committed to, then the map would be extended. The map then would be extended. That would bring with it uh, the other entitlements, those that would then be revalidated on the effective date of the development agreement. So that's the specific response. Um, is it an accepted way of continuing the underlying permits? Yes, it is, but we would be in a situation that I described of one year ago. Just because you extend those permits for a year doesn't mean you get the related authority to get the full dedication of the right of way and dedications that are needed. This, the dedication that's being offered by the owner and would be deemed to be adequate consideration to the city is a greater footprint, if you will. We could not do it individually, but we can do it collectively through a development agreement. So uh, that's the straightforward answer to your question. Uh, it's been reviewed by council for the developer, and she's in agreement with that concept. Okay, thank you. Are there any commission questions? I have um, one brief one. Um, just uh, to build or or, um, or Brent was um, how long has this extension been contemplated? Like it was was it planning to be on time and recently because of COVID nineteen or something else uh, we've needed to make this extension or has it just kind of lingered on and. We knew we'd probably have to do this. Well, I, I don't know. I know the conversations that have started were started right at, if I recall correctly, the end of February, the beginning of March, and uh, the developer can speak for himself, but there were different uh, approaches to this, um, including approaching the city to have the city purchase uh, the property. Um, I think you're all probably aware, maybe some more than others, of the city's inability financially to do that, mm -hmm. especially with the time frame I'm speaking of, of beginning uh, roughly well, about a week before. I think the first shelter in place order, if I remember correctly, was March 16th. Mm -hmm. So there were conversations to about what was going to happen to the project at that time. Um, that are matters of public record. So is it a, is it a something that's come about to address the solution in that time frame? The answer is yes. Okay. Um, I think all parties uh, took different positions during this time period. Um, and that's my perspective. I think Brent Brent has his own. You know, that's I'm the city attorney. I think Brent has his perspective too. <laughs> I guess he's holding. Okay, thank you. There it is. <laughs> That's it. That's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Wong, anything from you? Um, yeah, so I guess I had a question and a comment as well. So what is the impact if we don't approve this, if we vote no? Uh, your recommendation would be no to the city council. The city council has to take that into consideration uh, when they hear the matter. Okay. Uh, the, the, the reality is if you don't go forward, if the city doesn't go forward with the development agreement, the alternative for requiring the right-of-ways would have to be in order to keep the time frame, and I think you have um, substantial evidence on 2.2 about the urgency of need needing to connect to uh, I'm trying to think of the right word fully facilitate Napa logistics 
uh, that the city, regardless of the financial position, would probably have to uh, proceed uh, with eminent domain in some respects to acquire the needed right away. And we have to acquire the ability to provide legally adequate access to NAPA logistics. Okay, um, thank you. And I guess my other comment was, you had mentioned if we approve it, it basically freezes it, freezes it at the current development standards. And I know we're sort of in the middle of a general plan update, so I was just thinking if this was a new project, it would probably, it could be subject to new general plan standards. Do standards generally change with general plan updates? On, on this property, not likely. Um, mm -hmm. At the time it was annexed into the city, the county was very concerned about what future uses the city might allow on the property. And so there are industrial easements on the property that specify the development standards and uses shall be in accordance with the 1986 Napa Airport Industrial Specific Plan. So it, it, it has these additional levels of of requirements to kind of keep the development standards. What often is a benefit to developers or, or freezing other monetary rules for fees and things that, that might come forward that we don't know about today. That would be correct, Mr. Attorney. Um, Mr. Ryan, you had a Commissioner Mallory, any questions, comments? Um, just curious on where the, the five five years came about. Is it just something we thought of we just brought up or why not seven or just trying to, or three? Just thinking about how, how did that come about with the applicant? I think finally that was something that was requested by the developer. Uh, you know, I think a, a longer, if I recall correctly, I, and he can certainly comment, but I think at one point, 10 years was proposed, uh, but then the idea was if development, if it's going to occur, it's going to occur within the five-year time frame because of, well, because of the reality of the improvement of Devlin and South Kelly. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Ullman. I'll keep it real simple. Um, this is a negotiated deal for a development agreement. Uh, it seems, but I wasn't involved in the negotiation, um, but it seems as if we did okay in terms of getting uh, what we need in terms of the right of way. Uh, issues resolved, um, the dedication of that uh, at, you know, no cost other than freezing uh, current standards and, and so on. But um, I, I like uh, input from both uh, our city attorney and our um, director of uh, development in terms of if we left anything on the table, if a better agreement could have been um, crafted, uh, you know, any, any of their thoughts uh, regarding that um, at this point. Brent, I'll, I'll, let's I'll say talk you in, go first. Cooper's I'll go first, before, just Rob. in very general manners. One of the, I think, uh, Commissioner Altman, you kind of raised the issue of when you have a negotiated deal, you know, there's always buyer's remorse and seller's remorse. <laughs> So at some point you have to decide what, what's important on both sides. So from the applicant's point of view, they get five years of projects, you know, sustained and expire. That's a good thing. Um, and then from the city's point of view of a need to improve a road with the right of way, that's provided, that's a good thing. So there's good, there's good things on both sides. Um, I'm sure either side could think about something more they might want, but at the end of the day, you've got to have to kind of have a meeting of the minds. 
in response to the question, my response is going to be, uh, my standard would be, is there legally valid consideration for the city? And in a development agreement, um, it's got to be something that we couldn't otherwise require in the development process. And that's here, both in footprint for the right of way and dedication and timing. We couldn't achieve that through any imaginative combination of the CUPs or the map that's underneath this. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Anything else, Commissioner Ullman? Nope. That does it for me. Um, then we're going to move on to public comment. I do not have any items for public comment, but let me read my disclaimer. Um, item 2.4, considering a resolution recommending the City Council approve a development agreement for the Napa Airport Corporate Center Park approvals to extend the time period for acting on these approvals for five years after the development approval effective date. If you would like to make a public comment on this agenda item, please email N Jones at cityofamericancanyon.org and she will call you or you can call directly to 707-647-4348. We have no uh, public comments. Anything came in, Ms. Jones? Nothing? At this time, we have not received any public comment, Chairman Bell. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. Okay. Um, can, I, can I just intercede a moment? I see that developers on the on uh, is a participant, so I think we should just ask if the developer has any comments. Sure. Hi, this is Tim Shadler with Panatoni. Um, I, I had to call in because I'm having trouble with my Zoom, uh, um, so I think you can see me, but um, I had to call in on the phone. But you know, I, I appreciate this. This is. Um, We've been working on this project for 14 years. Uh, through the Great Recession, we almost lost it. Uh, now COVID crisis, and uh, we completely underestimated the complexity of the offsite improvements and on-site improvements. And you know, there's a reason why we haven't built it. It's because of those complexities. And um, you know, we did build Devlin Road for $3 million, uh, wrote a check and built that road, and um, are contributing to Green Island CFD. We also will be paying our fair share uh, for the South Kelly improvements and for the sewer pump station that uh, Mr. Nodell talked about earlier. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of public benefits to this project to see it go forward. Half the land has wetlands on it, and we've battled for five years uh, trying to get the wetland situation worked out and the lights at the end of the tunnel. And so we very much appreciate uh, a little more runway uh, to see this project move forward and, more importantly, finish all those improvements uh, that need to connect this park and uh, Napa Logistics and then eventually the Green Island Road. So obviously here for any questions, if there are any. And thank you, commissioners. Do you have any questions? I don't. I thank you. No, I'm good. I appreciate the comments, though. Mr. Wong or Malari, any comments, questions? No, thank you. Okay. No questions. Thank you for the additional information. So we're going to go on to uh, commissioner actions at this time. Any commission actions on this Excuse item? Excuse me, Chairman Goff, you still have not closed uh, the public hearing. Oh, I did that. I'm sorry. We're closing public comment. Thank you for reminding me. Um, and now we're going on to commissioner. Well, any commissioner comments? We went through none. Commission actions at this time. I'll make a, I'll uh, make a, res a motion to uh, for a resolution in the planning commission of City of American Canyon, California, 
recommending the city council approve a development agreement for the Napa Airport Corporate Center project approvals to extend the time period for acting on the approvals for five years for the project located at the corner of South Kelly Road and State Route 29 within the boundaries of the Napa Airport Industrial Area Specific Plan APN 057-090-086. I'll second the motion. Commissioner motion. Altman. Aye. Commissioner Mawari. Aye. Commissioner Wong. Aye. Vice Chairman Navarro. Aye. Chairman Gall. Aye. All right, thank you everybody for that. You are like to exit now would be a good time. Other than that, we're gonna move on. There's nothing under business. So we're gonna to go to staff items 4.1, active planning projects. Uh, thank you. I think um, one of the most important planning um, actions we've got on here is not on the list. <laughs> it's somebody's birthday today. Uh -oh. Mercifully, we haven't rolled into tomorrow. <laughs> we wanted to um, honor our uh, chair when it's at your birthday. Happy birthday. Who could think of a better way to spend it than with <laughs> all of your best friends? We're here for you. Happy birthday, Jeff. <laughs> Happy birthday. Very excited Happy. when I saw the agenda come out. It was on my, this day. I'm like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, Chairman Goff. <laughs> Thank you. And I promise you'll make it better by not singing. <laughs> we thank your lovely wife for letting you be here. Yeah. Oh. So, anyway, given the hour, if you, I just want to offer if you have any questions about the, about the list, um, it's on here. We just some new applications. We have some minor modifications for our friends at Napa Airport Commerce Center, um, reflecting the uh, uh, wetlands that you have. Um, our cannabis application period yielded one applicant. Um, and so that's under review by HDL. We'll have comments to the applicant at the um, early part of July. And, um, and then American Canyon will become a little more hip with a tattoo shop that William is processing. Over at Canyon Plaza, I think it is. That's right. So I think those are the recent highlights. But if you have any questions, I'd answer many. I think we should all go get planning commission tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> For your birthday. <laughs> I guess if you could say you're entitled. <laughs> So I guess my question is, we've got a variety of different gas stations on here. Isn't that funny? What's up with that? You know, it's, it's I, I find that over time, you know, there's, I guess there's marketers who are always looking at, you know, American Canyon and other places. Uh, for a while there, you know, we had coffee shops. Um, <laughs> And then you get one of them and they all the rest of them go away. And then, and then you get mini warehouse and one of them gets built and the rest go away. And then it's auto parts stores. And so, I don't know, I guess there's uh, the marketers are saying that we, we have a uh, unmet demand for gas stations. So now we've got a lot of gas station applications. And so that's, I think that's the reason. Okay. We do make a point of telling everybody who all else is in the mix, just so that they don't get surprised. Yeah, because there's, I think it's four of them on here. Yeah, there's four. And then on the cannabis, um, what there were two earlier um, mm -hmm. applicants. What's the status of those guys? Um, Resend is on hold. And Element 7, we received a resubmittal from them recently and gave them comments. Um, I'm, I'm due now to give them a call to see how they're doing uh, at responding to it. Okay. 
but they haven't they haven't they haven't informed me that they intend to go away. They have both told me that they're they're committed to move forward. So the church is all done, right? Uh, Holy Family Church, they are uh, close to getting their temporary occupancy. Uh, William, I think you're a little closer to knowing the status. Do you? I think they have their temporary mm -hmm. occupancy. They temporary They're working on their final. It looks really nice. The landscaping is all done. Yeah. The, the building, if you had a chance, you can go take a look at it. And mm -hmm. that steeple that I worried would worried would look very tall. It doesn't look tall at all. Yeah, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks nice. Mm -hmm. um, they have a few things that they have left over for fire and public works for the final, but mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I don't think it'll take them more than one or two weeks. So, okay. uh, Edison, do you want to add to that? Yeah, for uh, for public works, they only need to submit the mylars, which we require. And I don't know why we still require mylars. It's uh, old school. <laughs> Other than that, they're all uh, good. Oh, good. Great. Thank you. You know, at Vintage or a Village at Vintage Ranch, how many of those buildings are now open for occupancy? I think about six. Okay. So they expect it will take about another year to finish it up. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if you've gone on a tour of them, but they're very, very nice. I have been inside. I've been mm -hmm. through the parking lot and around, but I haven't mm -hmm. been inside one. Hmm. Okay. Anything else from the commission about projects? Kind of hard to tell if you guys are frozen. <laughs> like I'm looking at Commissioner Altman. I'm sure he's been in that exact same position for a while. <laughs> well, it's good to see things still moving along, even though mm -hmm. there's shelter in place and you're working from home. And mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's hard uh, skipping the meetings to make them so much longer. How mm. long is this meeting? <laughs> well, this was an unusual meeting. We wouldn't yeah. normally give you this many items. But with respect to keeping everything running uh, remotely, a lot of credit goes to Nicole. Um, she's set up the forms that folks can, can uh, fill in online. Mm. So that's the heart of, of our virtual city hall. So uh, really happy working closely with Jen Kanzenbach, but Nicole has been just putting heart and soul into it. I really appreciated it. She's doing a terrific job. And I think everyone appreciates uh, the convenience that mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, provided us. It's something we want to do for a long time and, and she's been able to accomplish it in a very short order. Thank you, Brent. That's so nice of you. Well, it's deserved. Thanks. Awesome job, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Nicole. Thank you. And I appreciate too the organization she did to, today too. It's a lot of behind the scenes technical. So mm -hmm. she's been managing that really well. Well, thank you, Brent. So we are on to commissioner items. Any items from commissioners? I don't have anything. I don't have anything, just everyone to just stay safe. I know we're going through a lot of different uh, pandemic times and we have young kids at home like myself, but uh, just take it one day at a time. That's what I've learned. I'm just gonna take a moment to uh, wish everyone a wonderful Independence Day, 4th of July celebration. Um, as that's coming up right around the corner. Uh, wish we were having a fireworks, uh, even if nobody could uh, be specifically in the park to see it. 
uh, we could see it from our homes and uh, many parts of the community. So I'm bummed that that's not happening, but um, it's uh, still uh, important, important day. Um, and it's uh, right upon us. So happy fourth to everyone. Happy fourth. Happy fourth. Yeah. Not the fireworks that we're hearing every night, but <laughs> don't, I will not miss those. <laughs> we already have fireworks every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we don't we don't need the the um, illegal uh, <laughs> ones. We 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 could use a nice uh, professional display. However, they can do it over Zoom. <laughs> That's um, a good one. Uh, all right. Um, you know, my only comment is, my wife and I have been taking the opportunity during this time to uh, walk every morning and. Our goal during all this shutdown was to walk every street in American Canyon. Um, we have accomplished that except for out in Green Island Road just because of a little bit of a safety issue, but we've done some bicycling out there. Um, so, you know, the upside for me around COVID-19 and the shelter in place is that I've had the opportunity to virtually step on every street in our city and walk every street uh, and need an abundance of people. And, you know, everybody is been super supportive, super caring. Everybody I've come across in the city during this time has just been, you know, very caring, reaching out, seeing what they can do. Um, and it speaks a lot for our community on how community oriented and supporting that everybody has been. Um, so I just want to make sure everybody understands they're doing a fantastic job and just to keep up the good work and to stay safe. Well, and if you weren't sure who was waving at you at 7.05 a.m. this morning as you were on, uh, the walking path on Wetlands Edge. That was me. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you a few times too, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. You know, I did want to share that um, in February, our traffic calming group that was formed for Wetlands Edge Road, we got all of our signatures. Thankfully, before all the shelter in place stuff happened in March. And it was the last thing on my mind, but we were very happy to see that they installed the traffic calming in April. On our street, you probably noticed it if you've driven down Wetlands Edge Road in the 500 block. Has it been effective? You know, initially, I think it was. I think people really stopped to look at it. And I think now it's kind of anecdotally, um, I think it did make an impact. And now I'm not, I'm not sure. I think we have to... Um, we have to crunch some more of those speed camera numbers, I think, and find out. But, you know, it's, it's nice to see it up. I know I definitely appreciate it that it carried on. It was the last thing on my mind once the virus hit. Um, so if I could just update the commission. Um, sorry to jump in. But, yeah, so we have anecdotally found it to be effective, uh, but we are working with the police department to – uh, set up a speed study sometime in the next few weeks. Awesome. Well, thank you, Rick. We all appreciate it. The neighbors were all excited. Yeah, the, the response has been very positive from the neighborhood. Yeah, there were people a little bit further down the block in uh, some of the lower numbers who are interested in uh, seeing the same thing happen there if uh, this proves to be effective. Yeah, so if, if you're not aware of what we did there, the, um, the devices that we put in are temporary devices. If we do the speed study, we find them effective, we'll be doing a more permanent installation with concrete. And uh, the devices that we have right now are movable. We just basically need new bolts and we can, we can install them all over town and so it, it is our plan to keep moving them around town and try them in different areas to test their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I, I didn't have anything else. Just wanted to share that one, you know, good news item and like everyone else, you guys all stay safe. These are very interesting times. But overall, I like the meeting online. <laughs> Except yeah, for having disconnected my.
Although it's too bad we can't have cake. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't eat in the chamber hall halls normally anyway, so we can at home. <laughs> All right, everybody. I want to thank everybody, and we are adjourning for the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank Happy, you. Birthday. Happy birthday. Good night. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. <clears throat>